Chapter 11, Celebration and Alcohol After Gathering the Familia in the Living Room, our group headed towards the pub, with me standing between Astria and Elise on the walk. So serious, I heard that you've done pretty good in the dungeon. Did you keep your promise to make a profit while we were gone? Elise asks with a playful expression, I tilt my chin up and smirk with an arrogant expression, playing along with her joke. Of course, I've gone all the way to the sixth floor with minimal injury, in fact, I made around 80,000 valis. Although it's been shrunk to 60,000 after Astria made me buy some things for hobbies. My playful arrogance recedes into mock depression as I talk about my grand expense from earlier today, causing her to laugh. We continue some casual discussions with Elise making a joke or teasing whenever possible, her personality really is a delight to be in the presence of, able to lift up even the most gloomy of atmospheres. It makes me truly admire her as a captain and as a person, while also causing a slightly warm feeling to rise in my chest. I'm not an idiot who has no knowledge of emotions, I know that this feeling is attraction, a quickly growing feeling at that, but I force the feeling to be suppressed. As a member of an all-female familia, the last thing they would want is for their newest member to begin lusting over their captain, though I don't know what I would do if another person was to show attraction towards her. But that's an issue for future me. Eventually, we reach the hostess of fertility, the owner, and head chef, Mia Grande, welcoming us with open arms. After all, our familia are frequent patrons, and our attitudes cause no issues, what's not to love as a pub owner? It is quite funny when she sees me walking in with the rest of the familia, after all, I never told her what familia I'm a part of, it must be quite a shock that I'm part of a famously female one such as Astria. Sitting down at our reserved seating, with me sitting between Astria and Ryuo, which consists of several tables joined together, we begin ordering. I myself have been attempting to go through the menu for the past two times I've been here, ordering spaghetti and then roast chicken, continuing with the trend I order an item I haven't tried yet, one a bit more fantastical in fire lizard stir fry. Whether it is due to how they cook it or how the fire lizard simply tastes, it has a smoky accent, with it tasting like chicken for the most part with the tender consistency of beef. All in all, quite tasty. The conversations over the table, with me and Astria asking various questions about their expedition, were quite interesting. Although I had a bit of knowledge of the lower floors due to Rose's lessons and my own studies, hearing it in person was something else. While they avoided combat for the most part until coming into contact with the monster that drops the material they needed on the 42nd floor, combat in the dungeon is inevitable. I was impressed with how easily they dealt with the Goliath, the monster wrecks of the 17th floor, as well as their massacre of a monster party on the 29th floor, consisting of Bloodsaurus and Violas, I also inexplicably feel a pang of worry at the mention of Violas, but I decide to ignore it. As the night progresses and alcohol was consumed, the conversations began to become sillier and more slurred. Knowing that everybody in the familia got the development ability abnormal resistance which eliminated poisons, I ask Astria why alcohol is not considered a poison and removed. Apparently with the subconscious knowing they want the supposed poisonous effects to happen, the resistance doesn't happen, a similar phenomenon appears in birth control and sleep medication when intended to be used. Although many of the members have become drunk early into the celebration, there is still me, Ryuo, Selty, Noin, Kagaya, and Astria who are sober. Kagaya and Noin due to not liking the feeling of being intoxicated, Ryuo and Selty being elves are incredibly weak to alcohol, while Astria and myself are the designated, UMM, walkers? Yeah, designated walkers, ensuring everyone gets home safe and clean. With everybody talking with their own groups, I'm left in silence alongside Ryuo, trying to muster up the courage to talk to such a beautiful girl in this setting. Ah, uh, dash. We both stare at each other for a moment after interrupting the other with our attempt to start a conversation, then break out into a fit of giggles. I've never heard the elf giggle before, perhaps it's the atmosphere that caused her to loosen up? Either way, it sounds like a beautiful chime, enchanting even. You can start, Ryuo. Oh okay, I heard that you've improved quite a bit during our trip. Has that fixed your feeling of inadequacy? Why yeah, a little, though I still really want to catch up to you guys, especially after hearing about your adventures like this, I now know how important taking your time is when building your strength a little better now, I'm not so immature about such things. That's good, it shouldn't take too long for you to join us, as long as your magic continues to have such an effect, by the time you're level 2 you will probably be able to join us as a supporter. That's good to hear, I have been practicing picking up magic stones lately. This causes her to giggle once again, charming me once again. I overheard your conversation with Elise on the way here, you picked up some hobbies. Yep, I got a nice liar since I played a similar instrument before coming here, and although I'm not great at art, a whittling set as well. I hope that my increase in dexterity will help increase my skill in both. Hmm, I myself have a flute that I like to play, it comes from my homeland so I have mixed feelings about it. I bet you sound beautiful using an instrument, once I get good enough I'd love to play with you. We stare into each other's eyes for a moment, my heartbeat picking up and the other conversations drowning out into silence. Time seems to stretch as I peer into the two dazzling blue orbs. Only breaking out of the trance after Ryuo averts her eyes, a blush reaching all the way to her ears. With a lull in our conversation, I quickly down my nearly untouched ale I planned to slowly sip throughout the night, clearing my head of my haze incited by the enchanting fairy. 
Once our mutual embarrassment dissipates, we continue our conversation, learning more about each other's personal lives, me being vague in some matters when concerning my coming from another world, but still roughly telling by the truth, although at my age the timeline is shrunk. I also learn about why she left her elven forest, especially at such a young age, it was due to her homeland's prejudice and dislike against other races which she found disgusting, she came to Orario, the hotspot of all races, intending to shred the previous racism she had accrued throughout her growing up. After meeting Astria and Elise, she decided the best way to combat her homeland's racism is to protect all the races as a paragon of justice. Well, I certainly admire your tenacity and your reason for joining Astria. It makes my own pale in comparison, oh why did I join my familia? I appeared in the dungeon out of the sky and defeated a super strong monster while being witnessed by her entire familia. She told me that I would be used and wrung for information like a wet rag without her protection, so here I am. I finish with a light chuckle while she descends into giggles, causing my mind to blank. It's due to this sudden loss of brain power, I mindlessly share my true thoughts. Your laugh is really beautiful, Ryu. Her cackling quickly stops, and a red blush appears as her eyes widen, blinking at an increasing pace. I turn away quickly once I realize what I've said and look down at the table in embarrassment. I I am sorry f for suddenly dash. My hastened apology is interrupted by a mug slamming to the table. I turn over to see Ryu with a dazed expression with glossy eyes, while Asta's mug of wine is empty, the only evidence of what transpired is the dribble of red liquid rolling down Ryu's cheek. The entire table becomes silent and stares at Ryuo, I guess it's rare for her to consume alcohol. Before I could formulate a hypothesis, Ryuo looks towards me with a lopsided smile before hugging me. I freeze while my heartbeat rapidly picks up and warmth spreads across my body, particularly my face. Oh shit, I'm attracted to two girls in my familia, very attracted even. The rest of the table is in a similar state of shock, only Astria forming a wide grin at the situation. Breaking us out of our paralyzed states, Ryuo begins mumbling with a dazed tone. MMM, warm, fuzzy feelings, he he, heek, warm fuzzies. Oh my god, she's adorable? And it seems that elves are indeed weak to alcohol, as she promptly lays down on my lap and passes out. A moment of silence ensues with the familia as my light buzz from before has been completely extinguished due to what had transpired. Only Elise has the courage to speak up at the table. D did, did that just happen? T that Ryuo, our Ryuo, just did that. As everyone takes their time, slowly accepting the situation, only one remains completely unaffected, that being our resident goddess. Fu fu fu, oh Ryuo, my sweet innocent child, fu fu, ha ha ha. She then devolves into a fit of laughter while the rest of us comes to terms with everything. Kagaya, Elise, and Lyra, originally looking like their world had completely shattered, morphed their expressions into something I can only describe as wicked. Casting a silent prayer for the teasing Ryuo should expect to receive in the future, I attempt to move her off my lap onto Nice, who is sitting next to her, though after nudging her head, her arms reflexively wrap around my waist. I concede to the situation while breathing slowly, casting my excitation at having such a pretty girl on my lap away. Shortly after, everyone is prepared to go home, with only Asta and Meruo needing help getting back, Kagaya and Noin decide to help them while I am of course stuck with the passed out Ryuo. Receiving devilish smirks when asking anyone else to take her, even including Astria, I'm left with carrying her back home. Initially wanting to do a princess carry, that thought is quickly cast out as she tries to hug me in her sleep, leading to an uncomfortable position. And unfortunately, due to her being three levels above me, even her unconscious strength is enough to completely overpower me. Conceding to her slumbering wishes, I carry her to the stardust garden on my back with her arms tightly wrapped around my neck. I forcibly put my head down to ignore the jeers and stares from passersby and my own familia during the journey, worrying about how this might affect my and Ryuo's future relationship. Finally reaching home, I quickly glance at everybody with a pleading expression, while verbally asking for someone to take her to her room. The only thing I receive being teasing smirks and directions to Ryuo's room from Elise. Accepting my fate, I take Ryuo to her room and then lay her on her bed, ensuring that she's laying on her side in case she vomits during the night. Taking off her shoes and getting her tucked in, I notice a sheen of sweat adorning her face, so I quickly return with a wet rag before lightly wiping off the sweat from her face. Turning off the lights, I then leave the room, closing the door on the way out, only to be met with the sly smiles of Astria, Lyra, Kagaya, and Elise. Reaching levels of embarrassment I never knew I could, I run down the hall to my room, unknowingly using stellar magic to enhance my speed, before shutting the door and the lights, casting off my clothes, and instantly falling asleep on my bed. Not even attempting to think about what could happen tomorrow. Chapter 12, Morning and Sword Style. Celestial Swordsman, Danmachi OC by Omega LUL 1234--Ryu POV. U U U, Ugh. I slowly, agonizingly, regain my unconsciousness, blinking away the sleep in my eyes and wiping away the thin film of paste from my lips. Stretching with a slight yawn, I think over what had happened the night before while basking under the morning rays. Although drunkenness from alcohol is not considered a poisonous effect, luckily, the hangover effect is, it's partly for this reason that many adventurers choose abnormal resistance as their first development ability, other than being immune to dangerous poisons of course. We had gone to the Hostess of Fertility to celebrate our successful expedition as usual and had a pleasant dinner. 
Remembering more from the night, a smile appears on my face, Elise had made some jokes as usual right after sitting down, she always knows how to light up a room. Then I had a very pleasant conversation with Sirius, the newbie. It's quite odd, how swiftly I've warmed up to him. Could it be due to how he saved us on our first encounter? How he spent his wish to do so? Or could it be something more related to his character that has seen me quickly find comfort in his presence? While I initially accepted him into the familia due to his unique situation, all reservations about him joining our family disappeared as he gained our trust with his honest and caring nature. As he demonstrated his determination to get stronger and his authentic dedication to see it through, I and the girl's opinion of him changed from acceptance to admiration and fondness. This is the second time I've felt this fond of someone so fast, the other being Elise, and mother I suppose, but that is a different feeling. Although I was certainly flustered when he complimented me under the moonlight that night and in such a romantic and charming way, after thinking it over, he certainly did not know the elven customs and was simply stating his honest thoughts. Though that's embarrassing in its own right. A knock on my door breaks me out of my reflection. Who, ahem, who is it? The door then opens to reveal Elise with a slightly messy bedhead and a wide smile on her face, from past experience, I know that this is her teasing smile. Oh, I'm surprised you're willing to come out of your bed after what happened last night. What? Was there something that happened? An intense feeling of foreboding washes over me as I see Elise's smile widen. W what happened exactly? Oh, this will be good. Do you remember how you got home? Or maybe wonder why your breath smell of wine? You were quite bold after all. Initially confused by her questions, I try to recall how I got home. And why does my breath smell of wine? Slowly, the memories come back to me, with an intense wave of shame to accompany them. I did that? What the hell was I thinking? I acted like I belong in the red light district. Much less touching him, I h hugged onto him like an elf in heat. How absolutely shameful, eh hey Elise, hh how do I face him after that? How indecent, immoral, humiliating. There there, I don't think it's as bad as you think, you were more cute than obscene, no one thinks less of you, you you you, Elise, I'm a lewd elf. What do I do now? Most likely nothing, he understands you were drunk and probably won't push for an explanation, though it may be a bit awkward between you two for a while. Besides, I don't think he minded the attention at all. Another wave of embarrassment washes over me at her words as my face heats up. Ha ha ha, anyways on a more serious note, remember my words from before? It seems you've found a man that you can be comfortable around, and from what I saw last night, makes you happy too, so don't let go of him. Much less than not backing away from his touch, you initiated it, so while it may be too early now, don't let him get away from you. I nod my head slightly as the heat across my face spreads throughout my body. Good good, but wow, to think a drunk Ryuo gets so affectionate, I want to experience that for myself. Now let's go down to eat. Sirius is practicing with Kagaya right now so you won't have to confront him right away. Sirius POV. After waking up, I took some time to myself in order to come to terms with the reality of what had occurred last night. I don't know much about elven customs, but I do know that they hate being touched unless by someone they immensely love or trust, and I doubt that I fit either of those conditions for Ryuo. I just hope she doesn't hate me and accuse me of taking advantage of her drunk state. It seems that my thoughts were clearly written on my face during breakfast, as Astria quickly assured me that Ryua wouldn't blame me, but rather blame herself, and to simply let the awkwardness fade naturally, though she or Elise would step in if they had to. Planning on getting ready for another dungeon dive, I'm stopped by Kagaya before I can enter my room. Serious, I see your swordsmanship has grown during the past week. I think you're ready for the next step. The next step. Well, let's go outside where I can demonstrate. We then make our way to the training grounds, only after I had changed into my training clothes of course. Now, while your basic abilities are up to PAR, to take the next step is to form your sword style, something unique where you take advantage of your strengths to gain an edge on your opponents. Alright, are you going to teach me your style? No, remember my words when we started training, after learning the basics, you will need to improve on your own, your own style should be unique and personally perfected, that is how the best warriors are made. You will need to create a style on your own, though I will teach you right now what a style entails, and if you become lost on your path I'll provide assistance if necessary. Oh, she's in complete teacher mode or as I like to call it, Kagaya-sensei. To make a sword style, you must understand your qualities, both good and bad, and how they translate into your combat abilities. You also want to know what kind of sword style you want. For instance, I rely on acceleration to quickly strike the opponent in their vitals, ending the fight swiftly and efficiently. This was, of course, mostly due to me being a Gajauno, a clan renowned for their assassins in the Far East. Although I do not wish to follow in the bloody footsteps of my clan, my combat abilities certainly reflect my birth. While others may be more affected by their skills and magic, especially those learning combat after receiving a Falna, like Ryuo, who has the skill arrow mana that increases her attack power the faster she runs, thus, her sword style adapted to that and focuses on speed. Now, let's begin our lesson in earnest. After a fairly long lesson, mostly a lecture with the odd demonstration of how she formed attributes into her sword style. Once she left, I take Kagaya's advice and sit down in a comfortable position, remembering her words of wisdom while thinking deeply in order to form my own sword style. What is the essence of my sword? 
And this isn't some bullshit from a Chinese cultivation novel, but rather, how do I approach combat with my sword? Everyone has their own sword style, showing in their movements, stances, strikes, and most notably, approach to combat. For example, some might have an approach focusing on attacking, in that case, is it focusing on the quantity or quality of attacks? Is it based on raw power or speed? Is magic involved, and how does that affect your style? After all, magic is not infinite. I think about how I approach combat instinctively. I question myself about what I want in my sword style, what am I good at, and what can be learned. After much deliberation, I decided to have a sword style focusing on attack counters. A mix of two approaches. To strike first, and either take advantage of the surprise or when the enemy makes their move, counter, and deal a quality strike. Speed would be a main attribute, as power will come from speed and my stellar magic when needed. While acrobatics would be another important aspect in order to move fluidly to take advantage of any openings. Every movement will be made with purpose, guiding me efficiently and safely on the path to victory, any unnecessary flair caused by my movements a bonus to distract my enemy. This freeform and fluid style would also easily incorporate ranged attacks and dual wielding, which I have become somewhat interested in. I then stand up, trying to put my attributes into a style, while being sure to not lose any of the basics of combat. While I can't practice my countering ability without a proper opponent, I can work on my acrobatics, speed, and attacks. So, clearing my head, especially the distracting thoughts of a certain elf, I dive into training. After practicing some acrobatic movements with my sword, I discover something. Using spins in combat in this world, is not an idiotic move only used for dramatics like on Earth. It's an actually useful technique, especially in countering, moving a strike to the side when parrying, you are already in the motion of a spin. Rather than stopping the movement and redirecting your sword towards the opponent, it's more beneficial to complete the spin, adding the additional rotational motion to the strike. Although you are defenseless for the time you're facing away from the opponent, you should have already dealt with their method of attack with the initial parry. The longer I think about it, the more benefits I see. You would be attacking on the opposite side of the opponent's weapon while moving towards it to be able to stop it if the enemy attacks. While doing the spin, you are able to get a visual grasp of the surroundings for a brief moment, and since your sword and eyes would be hidden from the opponent during the spin, upon exiting to attack would give you an additional level of surprise. As long as the enemy doesn't have a secret second weapon, you should be fine, and even then, the spin is not long enough for a secret weapon to be any more of a factor than before the spin. Although I certainly did not form my sword style after a single training session, I did understand what path I wished to take. There weren't absolutely no results though, I added spins and acrobatics to my repertoire though they both need a lot of practice to be used properly in combat. Thinking about my dungeon dive I plan to go on later today, I decide to stay on the first four floors, focusing on honing my technique with the weaker monsters rather than trying anything new and untested on War Shadows. Kagaya did say she would accompany me later so I could deal with group battles without retreating, she would also be able to correct me on any mistakes in my new sword style. So, after eating a filling lunch, notifying Kagaya of my departure, and preparing my equipment, I headed towards the dungeon alongside my trusty supervisor. I will also intentionally remove the embarrassing memory where Ryuo and I caught each other's sight on the way out before we promptly both averted our eyes. Yup, never happened. Although her blushing face was surely cute, my shame at the interaction outweighs it. Eventually, I and Kagaya reached the entrance to the dungeon, and after a final check that everything I need is in my belt, we set foot inside. Chapter 13, Months Progress and K's Trophly A month has passed since the Familia went on their expedition and seven weeks since I was transmigrated into this world. From being in the dungeon most days of the week, I've made a lot of progress both in stats and technique. Although my sword style still is not complete, though a sword style is never truly complete, the constant training and experience have developed it to be usable in combat. Still, according to Kagaya, my progress is excellent. Speaking of progress, my stats have grown significantly, enough to breeze through the dungeon up to the ninth floor. Equals 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 Name, Sirius. Level, 1. Strength, E439. Endurance, F387. Dexterity, E448. Agility, E-445. Magic, D-524. Skills, Heroic Will. Magic, Celestial Ascent. Equals 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 with my constant dungeon dives, I've also made enough income from selling the magic stones and monster drops to contribute to the familia, although a single day expedition from them to the middle floors would dwarf my income. My relationship with Ryuo has also returned to normal, although there is some lingering awkwardness when we are near each other or alone. It seems that Mother Astria's words were true, Ryuo didn't blame me at all, in fact, she thanked me for taking her back that night, although she couldn't look me in the eyes the entire time. 
And yes, I have given in to calling Mother Astria Mother, although I add her name to it much like Kagaya does. It was extremely embarrassing the first time it slipped out, but Mother Astria's happy smile made it worth it. Other than getting to know Orario, both in culture and direction, the only other notable thing to happen in this past month would be my progress with playing the liar and whittling. Tiring myself out in the morning and around noon with dungeon diving and training, while doing some light sword practice before bed, left me the afternoon free. With my body and mind exhausted, my time was taken by helping around the familia, chatting with the girls, walking around Orario, taking a nap under the sun, or my hobbies. It was initially tough to play the lyre due to it being quite different from a guitar, rather than using six strings and changing the notes by pressing the string to the fret, with a lyre the string's note remains unchanged. Luckily, the lyre I bought had a sufficient amount of strings so that I could use the entire musical scale along with sharps. The other thing is that instead of strumming, you pluck each string, plucking multiple at a time to get a chord. Luckily, my guess about the dexterity stat increasing my skill was true, as I had no problem with playing, only needing to practice to improve the subtle aspects of the music. Since I couldn't find any books on music, I had to create songs or translate ones from my memory into the lyre. Overall, an interesting and fulfilling way to pass the time, and once I was proficient enough in playing, I was able to become enchanted with the beautiful soft melodies it produced, truly a great purchase. Though tuning it is a bitch, I wonder if Ryu would still want to do the duet we talked about? If she even remembers. While my experience with the lyre was peaceful and pleasant, my progress with whittling was not so. It seems that I underestimated my lack of skill with art, and combining that with the intricate detail required for whittling, you get pitiful results. Especially when a shaved piece of wood goes out of control and ends up taking out a chunk of your model sword? Ha. Huh. So yeah, the progress is slow and painful, but still progress, I could only imagine how much worse it would be without the boost to my dexterity. So all in all, one relaxing and peaceful hobby where I can show off my otherworldly skill and songs and another more chaotic and delicate craft, where my talent is poor and my skill progresses through dedication and practice. Two very different ways to pass the time. Returning to my dungeon exploits, the new monsters that appear on floors 7, 8, and 9 are the Killer Ant, Needle Rabbit, Purple Moth, and Blue Papilio. The Killer Ant is also called the Newbie Killer along with the War Shadow, not due to its individual combat prowess, but due to its defense and ability to call many allies. When I first encountered its ally calling ability, I thanked my past self for getting training against many monsters from Kagaya. The Needle Rabbit is a plain monster that is simply a rabbit with a sharp horn on its head, specializing in agility to quickly stab its opponents. A purple moth is a monster that spreads poisonous powder, a pretty easy enemy to fight as long as you don't get covered in the powder multiple times. Since I encountered the poison, I am now able to get abnormal resistance as a development ability on my level up. Finally, the blue papilio, a rare monster that rather than being a monster, is more like a treasure, as the drop item the blue papilio wing, which drops with every kill, is used for many high quality potions. Currently, I am on the ninth floor, which by the guild's standards should be fairly dangerous for me, recommending an average of high D to C in stats to complete the floor. It's fairly safe for me though, with my magic, combat skills, and heroic will making me stronger than what my stats depict. In fact, I'm fairly certain I could explore floor 10, but there's no need to be reckless, once my stats reach an average of C I will likely start visiting it though. The reason I'm on the 9th floor right now is, surprisingly, not only for training but rather to complete a guild quest, a new experience for me. Since our familia is rank B, meaning that we, or rather the girls, have reached floor 40, we can accept any quests up to floor 40. Guild quests, when related to the dungeon, are nearly always collection quests from clients either in or outside Orario, normally being monster drops. Completing these quests gives you more money than regularly depositing the monster drops, though the quality of the item has to meet a certain standard. The quest I'm completing right now is to collect 25 killer ant carapaces and 30 needle rabbit tusks, due to the rarity of drop items on lower level monsters, it takes a lot of kills in order to complete such a request. I also can't damage the drop item due to the quality needing to be pristine, the issue with that is the drop item can't be damaged even on the monster before it dies, you can see why this would be a problem, especially for the killer ant carapaces. It took me a few tries to finally get the hang of killing the killer ant without slashing its body, the method being to stab through its eyes, piercing all the way to its brain. For the needle rabbits, it was a much simpler process, as even before the quest I never had the need to damage its horn. After two grueling days of hunting on the ninth floor, I'm nearly done with the quest, only needing one more carapace to cash out and have myself a celebratory dinner. Walking through the grass plain that coats the ninth floor while wiping off infinite eclipse that had just slain a group of goblins, I spot two killer ants near a rock formation. Looking to finish the quest, I silently step toward it, observing the surroundings in case of an ambush. Seeing no potential problems, I coat my legs in stellar magic and launch towards the first unsuspecting monster, cleanly thrusting my sword into its left eye, causing it to instantly burst into dust. The other one notices my presence and promptly starts shrieking, calling to its allies. Not wanting to end up in an ant swarm, I run towards the monster, my sword to the side, in response to my exposed posture, it attacks me with its two clawed arms, just as planned. Bending under the claw, I simultaneously bring my sword forward, piercing its eye as I pass by, creating a cloud of ash. 
Quick and efficient, just as an effective adventurer should be. Spotting the carapace that has luckily dropped, I smile deeply while pocketing both magic stones and the final needed drop item before bolting out of the area, not wanting to meet the potential horde of killer ants. After all, I have all I need for the quest and the last thing I want to see right now is another killer ant. Hell, I just might go to the 10th floor tomorrow so I don't have to encounter them. I eventually reach the surface while avoiding every monster on the way, wanting to submit the drops as soon as possible. Breathing in the fresh air that I haven't felt for 10 hours, I walk towards the guild at a leisurely pace. Spotting Rose sitting at her desk with no adventurers, I go up to submit the final drops from today, as yesterday I had already submitted a part of it. Afternoon, Rose. Here's the last of the drops for the quest. 16 killer ant carapaces and 8 needle rabbit tusks, all in pristine condition. Serious, good to see you're back. I'll confirm the items and prepare the form and the valise, you can go submit your magic stones in the meantime. I then go to the exchange booth and exchange my magic stones and the few drop items from today, netting me 16,000 valis. I then return to Rose to see a large pouch of what I assume to be valis and her signing some papers. I've confirmed the completion of the quest, here is your reward of 50,000 valis. Well done on leaving no damages to the items, just sign here to indicate the completion and that you have received the reward. I do as asked while placing the large pouch of valis into my bag, sheesh, 50,000 valis from a two-day quest, and with the magic stones and drop items during that time, I made roughly 80,000 in only two days. Insanely profitable for a level 1 like me, too bad that quests for the lower floors are so rare. I make good on the promise to myself and stop at a diner on the way home, specializing in meat. I treat myself to steak and potatoes with a nice glass of wine. While eating, I hear hushed whispers occupy the air, looking up at what had caused the commotion. I see two people enter the store, one a beautiful woman with long green hair and large pointed ears, longer than Ryuo and Celtis, and a girl around the age of 10 to 11, with long golden hair and a blank expression. After taking a moment to recognize their appearances, I realize who I'm seeing from their appearance in the anime and novel. The green-haired high elf is Reverial Joe's elf while the young human girl is Ace Wallenstein, Reveria is the level 6 vice-captain of the Loki Familia while Ace is a level 4 while holding the title of the fastest level up, reaching level 2 in only a year. Though I'm on track to break that record, I don't need to tell them that. While glancing at the two, I feel an inexplicable sensation, as if I'm on the cusp of remembering something, something important, but I can't. Dismissing this feeling, after all, this is my time to relax. I continue eating my meal in silence, noticing the two casting a few glances my way, particularly Reveria. I suppose it makes sense, my name has gone around this month after all, being a newbie level 1 member of the renowned Estria Familia, the famously all-female Familia will do that to you, though the interest usually stops at slight interest and some jealousy from the males. It seems that Reveria has a little more interest than usual though, which makes sense as the Loki and Estria Familias have worked together numerous times, the two being among the most powerful Familias in Orario. Loki being a powerhouse with three level SIXS while Astria is known as the city's police force along with Ganesha. Eventually, I finish my food and pay the tab before heading out, ready to submit the quest completion paper and reward to Lyra so she can record it, it seems we both like to document our activities. On my way out, I'm stopped by Reveria calling out to me, excuse me, would you happen to be the new member of the Astria familia? It seems that her curiosity won over her apprehension. Indeed I am, serious at your service, and you must be Nine Hells Reveria of the Loki familia. Did you need something? No, it was simply my curiosity. I was wondering how long you've been adventuring. This would be almost my second month, and no I didn't receive a Falna before Astria. Hmm, sorry for my prying, it is simply puzzling why she would suddenly accept a man into her familia, you must be quite something. She smiles kindly at me, it's hard to get a read on the high elf, she simultaneously has the aura of royalty befitting her race, experience befitting her age, yet also innocence and gentleness completely contrasting her previous attributes. Though I guess those were what made her leave her isolated forest. Ah, not really, apparently my progress has been great, but I think a lot of that is due to my mentors, those girls are pretty amazing after all. Indeed they are, well I won't take any more of your time, thank you for satisfying my curiosity, have a good afternoon, Sirius. You too, also I think you're supposed to cut that first. I take my leave as Reveria begins berating Ace about cutting her steak, and not eating the whole thing like she was. It was quite a comical sight. Reaching home, I drop off my equipment, which had already been cleaned at the guild, then head down to the office to deliver the quest paper and reward. Upon entering, I see Lyra writing something down while Kagaya and Ryuo are both reading on the sofa. Hey, girls, I finished the quest, here. I say while handing the things over to Lyra, who looked up from her writing with an expression of slight surprise. Already? Didn't you start that yesterday? Yep, got the final 24 drops today. Good job, requests where they need pristine quality are always hard. How much did you make from it? Hmm, with the magic stones from the kills alongside it, I got around 80,000 valis. 80, 000. Oh? It seems my profits surprised Ryuo. Yep, impressed. Yes yes, great job Sirius, but my little student, you shouldn't get too cocky. From your recent status update, I've noticed that your endurance has been lagging behind. Do we need to have another training session? 
I shudder from the resurfaced memory of my most recent training session, which was essentially just me trying to survive Kagaya's relentless attacks in order to build up my endurance stat. And no ma'am, I've been very careful in the dungeon, no overconfidence here. HNN? Well anyways, now that you've completed your first quest, what's your next goal? Ah, uh, I plan to go to the 10th floor tomorrow. Learn how to fight in bad visibility and also gain experience against the new monsters that appear. Especially bad bats and their sonic attack magic, then I can start practicing the magic reflection on infinite eclipse. Alright. Do be careful about reflecting magic, it is incredibly difficult. I wonder if you could practice it here with Selty or Elisa's magic, though with them being much higher levels, it might be more dangerous than the imps. I'll be sure to keep it in mind. Anyways, I'm gonna have a nap then train, see you girls at dinner. See you? I then went back upstairs to go to bed. I wish I could have the comfort of a bed while also sleeping under the sun or moonlight, after all, for some reason flies and mosquitoes don't bother humans in this world. Maybe I could make a hammock? All I would need is two poles and a big sheet. I write down the idea in my bedside journal for any notes while going to sleep. Maybe I could get them to install a couple in the garden? I did make quite a bit of money today. Pondering such various thoughts, I drift off to sleep. Chapter 14, Floor 10 and reflect cleaving through two needle rabbits, both of which had attacked at the same time. Unfortunately for them, their linear attacks are easily exploitable if you know how to dodge properly. Picking up their magic stones, I notice a small tear on my backpack. Perhaps I should look to upgrade some of my gear? Primarily my armor and bag, since my stats have increased I can now wear heavier armor without it impeding my movements, and I'd like to get a bag that is more resilient and stays flush with my back. Pocketing that information for later, I make my way towards the stairs to the 10th floor. From my studies about this floor, it should be the same structure as the 8th and 9th floors but with a slight mist that gets much thicker on the 12th floor. It should also be noted that the size of each floor increases as you go deeper, it makes you wonder, just how large is the final floor? Anyway, the monsters on the 10th floor are needle rabbits, which I am already seasoned against. Orcs, a strength-based monster that could likely kill me with one good hit, imps, a small demon monster that uses wit and group tactics. And finally bad bats, a flying bat monster with sharp fangs and shoots sonic magic, mainly to disorient its enemies. I'm hoping to encounter a bad bat in order to test the reflection ability of infinite eclipse, but the main priority for today is to gauge the difficulty of the floor and get some initial experience against its monsters, discovering any weaknesses that I would need to train before hunting here properly. Entering the 10th floor, I see a vast plain, though it is shrouded in a haze, like a morning mist. While I could see how some might lose their direction in this fog, it is thin enough to not affect combat, so that's good to know. It doesn't take too long to find the first group of monsters, an orc standing near a boulder, and from what I can see, a couple of imps hiding around the rock, probably looking to ambush anyone who fights the orc. Cunning fuckers. With their element of surprise gone, it shouldn't be that bad of a fight, though I'll have to be vigilant of any other ambushers. Well, time to see what the monsters on this floor are all about. Walking towards the orc, I notice that the imps have retreated behind the boulder. I guess their senses are pretty good, perception and intelligence build I suppose. The orc eventually notices me, turning its pig head toward me, and lets out a loud roar, the guild said nothing of it being able to call allies, so I guess it's an intimidation tactic. I coat my body in stellar magic, feeling the familiar thrum of power imbue my body, before rocketing forward. It throws out a punch with surprising speed, though rather than agile, the speed is a consequence of its strength, so it lacks control. Dodging the fist, I attempt to cut off its arm as I pass by, but surprisingly, I can only reach halfway, hopefully, it's enough to take it off commission. I guess orcs also have ample durability. Eyeing my opponent, I try to think of a strategy, keeping in mind the imps that are likely to attack at any moment of weakness. The orc's body is large, brimming with muscles and fat, even if I was able to enchant my sword with stellar magic I'm not sure I would be able to deal a killing blow, and being caught so close would be a death sentence. Thus, the optimal path is for me to go for the head, dealing a vital blow before facing the imps, though I'll need to get it closer to the ground to easily strike it. I once again leap to its side with the mangled arm, though I'm caught by surprise when it still attacks me. Barely avoiding the surprise blow, I take the chance to completely remove the arm with a downward slash while passing by, landing with a spin to slash at its legs, aiming for the tendons behind the knee, making it kneel while screaming in pain, holding its severed arm. Not giving it any time to collect itself, I thrust right into its neck, killing it instantly. At least, that was supposed to happen. I think I underestimated its endurance, even after piercing through its throat and spine, it's still alive. Seeing its remaining arm move towards me, I quickly jump back, needing to leave infinite eclipse due to it being stuck solid into its neck. I really need to learn how to enchant my blade with stellar magic. Pulling out more mine to enhance myself, I take out my dagger that has seen minimal use in the dungeon. At least I still train my hand-to-hand -hand combat occasionally. It's at this moment that the imps decide to attack, turning on a point. I behead the closest one while continuing my spin to block the claws of another, causing the last two to retreat. It appears there was a third imp behind the boulder, well, there are two now. Now surrounded by the three monsters, I recall my training and experience in group and encircled fights, the key in these situations, is speed. 
Jumping towards the closest imp, I plunge the dagger into its neck, bending my body sideways to avoid its own attack. Recovered from its state, the orc raises its body, blood flowing down its large frame. Seriously, how is it still alive? I spin to avoid an attack from an imp, completing a complete turn before embedding my dagger in the back of its head. Well, that's the ambush dealt with, now to just finish off the big guy. Seeing its limping state, I conclude that taking out its legs is the optimal strategy for taking it out, other than ranged attacks, which I do not have. Once I get it to its knees again, instead of trying to kill it through the neck, I'll pierce its brain directly, since there's no hope for this dagger to deal a blow to its heart. Diving towards me with its arm outstretched, I hastily dodge out of the way before turning around while condensing the stellar magic to my legs and rushing towards it with an enhanced leap. Landing right behind the orc, I quickly deal two strikes to its remaining leg, one to the Achilles heel and one behind its knee, bringing the large beast down once again. Making use of my position, I then jump onto its back before bringing my dagger down onto its head with all my strength. The moment I feel the skull shatter, the resistance on my blade gives and the orc bursts into ash, leaving behind a magic stone, a roll of orc hide, and most importantly, my treasured sword. Packing the magic stones and the drop item, I look over infinite eclipse, thankfully seeing no damage, though the whole thing is caked in blood and fat. Wiping off the blade, I then continue my journey through the floor. It takes a little while before I finally encounter what I wanted, a bad bat, specifically, three of them circling a tree. How they fight is by sending their sound magic that disorients adventurers before swooping down and finishing the kill with their fangs. Not the worst to fight against, but they quickly become dangerous if there is another monster attacking. Imagine fighting an orc while constantly being distracted by both the magic and the aerial threat. Yikes. Their magic being weak will be good to practice my reflection ability against as it's not that dangerous to get hit by as long as there isn't a large group, so I'll deal with two of them before practicing. They eventually spot me and fly toward me, circling me from above before I hear shrill noise originating from them, like the highest note on a flute. Narrowing my eyes to see the magic in effect, I see a slight distortion coming toward me, once it reaches me, I only feel a slight pressure against my ears, but nothing notable. That's weird, even for level 2s the disorientation should be immense, only getting used to it after being exposed multiple times, so for a level 1 getting hit by it for the first time, I should be in a slight daze right now. Wait, could it be heroic will? It does make me immune to mental attacks. I guess it would make sense for a disorienting magic to count as a mental attack. These guys are really the best training partners, aren't they? Although the pressure against my ears doesn't affect my combat capabilities, at least I can feel it enough to know if I have properly reflected the magic. Seeing that their attack didn't have an effect, the bad bats continue firing off their magic, while I begin trying to reflect the magic. After around 15 minutes of trying, I eventually reflect their magic successfully, sending two of them plummeting out of the sky. Wanting to return to the surface, I fake being stunned, tricking the last monster to dive down, before it can touch me, I send out my sword, bisecting it in one slash. Pocketing the three magic stones, I think about the fight, well, if that can even count as a fight. Kagaya was absolutely correct to say that it will be hard to reflect magic properly. If I had to explain it, it felt like there is a core to the magic, and by hitting it the right way, like getting a perfect bullseye in darts. If this is the case for all magics, I can only hope that this core doesn't need to be struck differently for each individual magic, or this ability would quickly become too complex. But that is a worry for later, for now, it's time to get back home and maybe install a hammock like I had thought of last night. Cashing out my loot at the guild, I head towards the shopping district, finding a sheet that would be a good size as well as two poles from the carpenter before going home. Once back, I clean and store my equipment before taking a bath. After having a small lunch, I ask Asta about my hammock idea, she likes crafts, and as a dwarf, is quite talented at them too, so she would be the best to help me with this new invention. She gets a sudden gleam in her eyes as I keep talking before taking the poles and sheet and running to her room, saying that she would handle everything. I guess my idea ignited her creative spirit. Making my way toward the training ground to practice my sword, I spot Elise doing her own set of drills. I decided to ask her about my issue regarding equipment. Hey, Elise. Oh, hey Sirius, how was the dungeon? It was good, step foot into the 10th floor today, it seems that the bad bats attack counts as a mental one so I'm immune. Wow, that's lucky, your skill is quite something, even compared to my own amazing one. Yes yes, your skill is awesome. Anyways, I was wondering if you could help me with something. Yeah, what's wrong? I think it's about time for an equipment upgrade, I like the style I have but I'd want a tougher leather or cloth around the joints. As for my bag, I need a new one that's more durable and can stick to my back better, I don't like it flailing around in combat. Sure thing, I got to go to the guild early tomorrow, how about we go check out some shops afterward. Sounds good, it's a date. Oh ho, shouldn't you be saying those words to Ryu? S shut up, get back to training already, ha ha ha. And so, with my plans for tomorrow morning set, I lost myself in training. Chapter 15 to 3 months in Orario and Assistanta month has passed since my journey to the 10th floor. While it took some getting used to, I was eventually able to easily hunt on the 10th floor, the fact that I'm immune to bad bats being a large factor in how easily I was able to adjust to the new floor. During this time, my sword training progress has slowed down to a more gradual pace, slowly discovering new techniques and honing past ones. 
Luckily, with this new pace, I can divert my time to other abilities, such as my reflection ability. Now being able to reflect the bad bat's magic around half of the time, my issue now is striking the core correctly as I know where it is most of the time. After begging Elise to allow me to practice using her magic, I discovered that the core of magic is not always the center of the magic, but rather it can be anywhere in the magic. While I eventually was able to find the core in Elisa's magic, it takes too long to find it to be anywhere usable in combat against new enemies. The core of the magic isn't the only unique part of each magic as the way I need to hit Elisa's magic differs from the bad bats, if, for example, the bad bats magic needs a slice to reflect, then Elisa's magic needs a bat to reflect. Adjusting to the 10th floor and training in reflecting magic weren't the only things that happened the past month, as my stats have gone up to contend with the upper echelon of level 1s. Equals 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 Name, Sirius. Level, 1. Strength, C670. Endurance, D583. Dexterity, C676. Agility, C679. Magic, B784. Skills. Heroic will. Magic. Celestial ascent. Equals 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 with my stats having an average of C, it's recommended by the guild to only explore up to the 9th floor, but due to my combat skills, magic, and first class sword, I'm much stronger than what my stats suggest. Though I said I had acclimated to the 10th floor, I've gone beyond to the 12th floor. The 11th floor introduces new monsters such as Hard Armoreds, an armadillo monster specializing in defense, Silverbacks, a large ape monster specializing in strength, and finally, the so-called boss of the upper floors, an infant dragon. Though I have yet to encounter it, infant dragons are level 2 monsters, the first of its kind and the only level 2 on the upper floors. As its name states, it is a dragon-type monster, a small one, and able to breathe fire or attack with its claws. Being a rare monster, it's extremely hard to encounter, though in exchange it always drops a drop item. I think I could beat it, mainly due to heroic will boosting my stats against stronger opponents, but I would want one of the girls to watch over the battle so I don't die. While the 12th floor contains the same monsters as the 11th, the mist on the 12th floor becomes much thicker, enough to affect combat ability. The fog makes the 12th floor extremely dangerous, not for the combat itself, but for how easily one can get ambushed without knowing or get hit by a surprise attack. It's for this reason, and the fear of getting lost, that I've spent most of my recent time on the 11th floor instead. Thinking back on my progress throughout the month, maybe I should get a diary of some sort. I do have my status progression, getting an update weekly, but that doesn't tell anything about my experiences or just things that happen in daily life. Though most of the time it would be boring. Dear diary, today I killed more monsters on the 11th floor, again, I then went home, trained, ate with the familia, then played the liar to lull myself to sleep, the end. Maybe something to write down any unique events would be nice. Speaking of unique events, Asta created the hammock about a week after giving the idea to her. Having it set up in the garden, it was just as great as I had envisioned, laying down with the soft breeze and warming sun keeping you at a perfect temperature, hearing the muffled sounds of the city, smelling the faint scent of flowers littered around the garden. It was serene. The girls of the familia agreed, so there were another five of them installed. Mother Astria took a particular liking to the hammock, quickly claiming the one under the shade to spend her day reading in. I also witnessed my first death. It was equally as gruesome as it was quick. A couple of adventurers, both males looking around their thirties. It was on the tenth floor, both were facing an orc, one of them dodged the wrong way and was launched into a tree head first, either killing him instantly or close to it while his partner was decapitated by a punch while in his state of shock. It happened in an instant, and with me being so far away, there was nothing I could do except take their weapons and notify the guild. It was shocking how easily I accepted the deaths, not freaking out during or after the incident. Could it be killing goblins and other humanoid monsters that helped? Me logically accepting the fact the dangers that are associated with being an adventurer, especially a level 1? Either way, I am glad for my mental fortitude. Being part of Orario's police force familia, if there is another group like Evil Us that makes its appearance, I will have to kill humans. Not even Evil Us, just evil adventurers I'll eventually have to put down. What did change within me was once again realizing how feeble and fragile life is. As I got stronger, I unconsciously believed in my power and the durability that comes with it, but I had forgotten that the monsters are also getting stronger as I go deeper, and even goblins can kill you if you get conceited or just unlucky. This change spurred another motivation to get stronger, not only to catch up to my familia but to survive and save others from cruel fates. Anyways, today the girls are preparing for their expedition which is happening in a couple of days, now how this affects me, is that I've essentially become Lyra's assistant. 
Sometime a couple of weeks ago, Lyra found out about my organizational skills, and after getting me to help her with some stuff, she discovered that my mathematics skills are superior to even hers. Going to modern schooling will do that to you. So periodically, she has been getting me to help out either in her bomb creation or more often with familiar matters, mostly economics. Over this period of time, I've come to realize how important Lyra is to the familia. Mother Astria is the head, giving us power with a fauna, dealing with other deities, and gracing us with her wisdom and motherly aura. Elise is the captain, leading the others from the front, having an upbeat attitude, always being able to raise morale, dealing with other familias, and being strong. Lyra, while not having an official title, would be the manager, dealing with the economics, creating plans and strategies, assigning patrols, and dealing with merchants and the guild. Those three women are the foundation of the Astria Familia. As this is the first expedition since becoming her assistant, she has taken this as a training opportunity, teaching me all she knows. Purchasing provisions and potions in bulk while ensuring quality at a great price, setting up the plan for the expedition while looking over each floor, their maps, monsters, environment, special characteristics, and other various tasks. The mission for this expedition is to gather various materials on the 25th floor, although getting the materials will be no issue for the familia, who have gone all the way to the 42nd floor, the problem is the number of materials needed. The number is impossible to gather in one day, so they must either stay on the floor with monsters for multiple days or leave for the 28th floor, a safety point, to sleep. Either strategy they choose, they also have to kill the monster wrecks of the 27th floor, the Amphisbina, though they will be assisted by the Loki Familia while they go on their own expedition. The reason they have to fight it is that they must kill it to reach the 28th floor and with the Amphisbina's unique trait to move between floors 25 to 27, they can't risk being ambushed while collecting materials. Either way, today's schedule consists of purchasing Undine Cloths, a blue cloth that enables the user to swim better while reducing water resistance and pressure, an essential item for exploring floors 25 to 27, and later meeting the Loki Familia to finalize their plans in the joint journey to the 28th floor and taking out the Amphispina. We had just finished buying the Undine Cloths, buying more than needed for a better deal as it doesn't deteriorate and will eventually need new ones, before reaching home. As soon as we entered we began the routine that has been happening for the past two days, Lyra went into the office to write down the purchases while I placed the items in the storage room. A room slightly larger than my bedroom with no windows, filled with shelves stocked with spare weapons, potions, armor, non-perishable foods for the dungeon, and various other items. Leaving the room, I head toward the office, lightly tapping on the door before opening it. Hey Lyra, I put all the needed undine cloths in the section meant for the expedition, leaving two spares while putting the rest into the armor section. Finishing her note, she looks up and gives me a wry smile. Thanks, you know, if you want I can give you Ryu's old undine cloth to wear under your armor now that we have new ones, we shouldn't waste resources after all. Yes, for some inexplicable reason, for the past month, the girls have been teasing me about Ryu. I don't really understand why, after all, we didn't share an embarrassing moment together since the pub incident. So why now? Ah, thinking about it, it could have been when Ryu decided to take up my offer of a duet. It took a minute to get used to each other, but eventually, we were able to play together, creating an extremely pleasant tune. Since then we've been playing together at least once a week, usually at night, outside under the moonlight, it's quite a magical experience that captivates me every time. From our serenading sessions, I learned quite a few elven songs from Ryu's homeland, they are all extremely beautiful when played on the lyre, and that beauty is amplified when Ryu's soothing flute is added to it. While I myself have shown Ryu a few songs of my own, she particularly liked Stairway to Heaven. Shaking myself out of my spiraling thoughts, I return my attention to Lyra. Yeah yeah, you just love to tease me, don't you? Anyways, am I able to train right now? Yeah, but we'll be meeting the Loki Familia here in a few hours, you won't need to do anything but I want you there to learn how interfamilia meetings like these go. Alright, see you then. I then spent the next hours until the meeting deep in training, honing my sword style while also adding different, irregular sword slashes, trying to simulate using my magic reflect in combat, though it's hard to visualize without a target. Finishing my imaginary fight and deactivating Celestial Ascent, I'm broken out of my concentration by the sound of clapping. Turning to the source, I spot Riveria and Ace of the Loki Familia, Riveria giving me an impressed smile while Ace is looking at me with an excited look, as excited as a straight face can be. That was impressive, you don't look like someone who has only started adventuring three months ago. Nice to see you, Riveria, Ace. Shit, am I late for the meeting? Language, and no, we were just training in the dungeon and decided to meet Finn and Gareth here. I have to ask, what was that magic you used? It seemed extremely adaptable. Thank God. And it's just simple enhancement magic, though I can manipulate the enhancement a little. I then demonstrate by wrapping my arm in stellar magic before moving it to my hand, then dissipating it. Looking back to the guests, I see Riveria wearing a look of shock while Ace has her eyes widened, looking intently at me. No chant? Or was it a delayed cast? Oh, I forgot to mention that. It is indeed chantless, it's pretty useful in combat, though I haven't scratched the surface of its capabilities. Quite a remarkable magic you have, and at level 1, as well. Anyways, assuming you're part of the meeting, it seems that Finn and Gareth have arrived, so it will be starting soon. 
Thanks, I should go get ready, I suppose I'll see you soon. I then run to my room, change out of my training clothes, and wash my face before heading to the office, where the meeting would take place. Upon entering, I see Lyra, Elise, and Kagaya sitting on one of the couches, I decide to stand behind them to get any maps or books that they need. The door opens soon after revealing Reveria, Finn, and Gareth, the three executives of the Loki Familia. Not seeing Ace, I guess she decided to do something else to pass the time other than sitting in on a boring meeting. Good evening Elise, Lyra, and Kagaya, and you must be their newest member, Sirius. Let's not waste any time and begin the meeting, after all a certain sword princess seems pretty motivated to get back to training for some reason. Finn then smiles knowingly at me, I guess Ace enjoyed the show, but she's a level 4 with sword techniques even better than mine, was my magic that special? Whatever, right now I have to be the perfect assistant, no time for trivial thoughts. The meeting finishes an hour later, now with a strategy for the Amphisbina and a set schedule for each familia's expeditions. I made myself useful a few times, grabbing maps and books for them to look through and reference, and scrutinizing how the meeting went as Lyra asked. Seeing the Loki familia off, I then headed up to my room to prepare for sleep, realizing that I'm going to miss a week of not playing with Ryuo. Shit, their teasing must be getting to me. My mind becoming foggy, I rest my head on the pillow before drifting off to sleep chapter 16, cusp of level 2 and irregular infant dragon here's your status, serious, no matter how much I see it, your growth is simply astounding. I then take the paper from Mother Astria after putting my shirt back on. Equals 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 Name, Sirius. Level, 1. Strength, SS 1040. Endurance, S916. Dexterity, SS 1058. Agility, SS 1044. Magic, SS 1228. Skills. Heroic will. Magic. Celestial ascent. Equals 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 My endurance finally reached S, now I just have to complete a great feat to level up. Yes, but don't recklessly pursue such an endeavor, it's bad enough that you frequent the 14th floor alone as a level 1. Yeah, but I've already killed an infant dragon, a level 2, what more do I need to do for it to be considered a great feat? Hmm, well, needing to complete one singular great feat to level up is a common misconception. A level up occurs when the child has accumulated enough high quality exilia, the quality of exilia is determined by how impressive an action is. Due to the amount needed, it is often only done by completing a singular great feat by pushing oneself, but you defeating an infant dragon is plenty impressive, so if you defeat a few more you should be able to level up in no time. I see. What monsters I could possibly defeat to push me over the edge? I wonder if situations could count as a great feat, maybe defeating a large monster party? Monster parties are when a bunch of monsters is suddenly spawned near an adventurer, or when there is a large natural grouping of monsters. From the few times I've dealt with them, it has almost always led to an injury, if I was any less vigilant or skilled I would easily have been killed. While my experiences with monster parties have been tough, it pales in comparison to my fight with the infant dragon last week. As I had previously said, I was able to kill it, but it was still the hardest fight I have yet fought. While I was never in danger due to Elise watching me from the back, it didn't change how difficult it was to win, though it was incredibly rewarding when the entire familia went out to a restaurant to celebrate my achievement. So while I could follow Mother Astria's advice to take out another one or two of them, infant dragons are rare monsters, and as their description states, they are rare. It could be another month until I could find another one. Ha, huh, maybe some Minotaurs would do it? Anyways, what happens when you level up? More specific than getting stronger please. Hmm, well on a social level, the guild is notified and an announcement is made, while at the meeting of gods, the Denatus, that is held every month you get an alias, usually an adventurer gets one at level 2, then another at level 5, though sometimes adventurers stay with one their entire career, regardless of level ups, while others will get a new one every level up. I see, please get me a good alias, Ryu got the Gale and Elise got Scarlet Harnel, I couldn't stand being something like Ultimate Supreme Blade of Justice or something like that. Fufu, only if you're a good boy, now back to level UPS, for strength, every aspect gets a boost, it's estimated to be an increase of 1000 across all stats, you can see why no matter how strong a level 1 is, they are considered fodder compared to a level 2, but the difference in levels decreases as they get higher. It's also common for one to get a skill or magic on their level up, either relating to experiences or desire. Okay, so if I killed a bunch of needle rabbits, I could get a skill like rabbit slayer. Precisely, so if you decide to massacre a monster species, make sure it is one that will help you later on. The last thing that happens with a level up is gaining a development ability. While gaining a skill or magic is slightly related to talent with some adventurers not gaining either on a level up, development abilities are gained no matter what. 
Like skills, they relate to your experiences while some need specific conditions to fulfill, with children usually getting two or three choices to choose from. For example, as you use a sword and are quite proficient at it, it is likely that you'll have the option of the ability swordsman on your level up. I see, thank you Mother Astria. I then start getting dressed for the dungeon, changing into my newest armor, though unnamed, it certainly is a quality set of equipment. Made from orc hide as a base to ensure easy movement and flexibility while keeping the wearer protected. It also had plates of hard armored shells along the chest, thighs, and anywhere else that did not impede movement. Leaving the house with a small smile, I fiddle with my newly crafted necklace. As my whittling skills have increased during these five months in Orario, I eventually created something good enough to wear, the piece in question being the Astria Familia emblem, a sword with angel wings sprouting from the hilt. Mother Astria liked it quite a bit, so I made one for her too, hers being cleaner and more refined, while I kept the first draft. Eventually reaching the dungeon entrance, I ponder about how quiet the morning was. Most of the familia were doing their regular morning patrols around the city or doing their own tasks as usual, leaving Elise, Kagaya, Lyra, Nis, Ryu, and me at home. But today, there was some dispute in Rivera on the 18th floor and the guild asked the girls to resolve it, so I was left alone with Mother Astria. It felt quiet without the constant teasing from Elise to Ryu or Kagaya's crude words and antics. It was a shock when I came down for breakfast on a particularly hot morning to see Kagaya in only her bra and underwear. Though it was quite hilarious when Ryuo hastily covered my eyes with a speed befitting of her alias. Shaking my head, I dismissed the thoughts as I enter the dungeon. No matter how weak the monsters are, I must always be vigilant, especially as a level 1. Methodically and efficiently, I clear my way through the upper floors, reaching the 11th floor in an hour. Finishing off a silverback with a spinning slash to its neck, decapitating the beast, I hear a strangled scream in the distance. Making my way over to investigate, I see a group of three adventurers running with fear plane in their eyes. Running over to intercept them, I see that they have no injuries, yet there are various splashes of blood. If I hadn't seen the panic on their faces, I would suspect they had killed someone. Calm down, you're safe now. What happened? A an infant dragon? An irregular one? I it appeared out of nowhere, even Paul, level 2 Paul, just got cut to pieces. Shit, a strengthened species, commonly called irregulars, they are monsters that have grown stronger by eating magic stones. Although it depends on how many magic stones they've eaten, oftentimes irregulars are around a level higher than their normal counterpart, making them calamities for adventurers, especially on the upper floors. Shit, was there anyone back there before you fled? Why yeah, a group of five from the Mayak Familia, I've gotten potions from there a few times. Don't tell me you're going back there, it's suicide. I give the guy a pat before rushing toward the direction they came from. Sirius is a proud member of the Astria Familia, the Familia of Justice, how could I simply leave a group of adventurers to die while staying behind? And this might be a chance, my great feat, if a regular infant dragon isn't enough, maybe an irregular one could push me over the edge. Reaching the monster, I see it preparing to bring down its claws on a young dog-eared girl, younger than me. I concentrate all my stellar magic enchanting my body to my legs, hoping I can reach the girl in time. Taking off at a blistering speed, I grab onto her torso and move us both clear of the monster, narrowly avoiding the claws slamming into her previous position with strength and speed like nothing I've seen before. Collecting myself while the girl holds onto me for dear life, I grimace at the sight before me. Blood covered the ground with pieces of broken and carved bodies littering the ground, seeing no other survivors, I guess that this girl's group was killed. Hey, it's alright I got you. Are you part of the Mayak Familia? I receive a light nod in response. Poor girl, she had to witness her familia get slaughtered right in front of her before nearly getting killed by the same monster, it must have been terrifying. Detaching her hands from their firm grasp on my armor, I lower her to the ground. Here, go find someone to help, at least a level 3. I'll keep this thing busy in the meantime, alright. I hate to leave such a frightened girl alone, but I doubt the enemy will wait for me to give her a complete therapy session before attacking. Standing between the girl and the beast, I try to think of a plan, remembering my previous infant dragon fight while keeping in mind this one is much stronger. The key to my previous fight was to take out its front legs, removing its physical attacks and bringing it to the ground, before taking off its head, as its neck is its weakest vital point. The issue with attacking its neck is that it can breathe fire, so you have to attack from behind so you don't get burned to a crisp. This one, on the other hand, seems to have covered that weakness as I can tell from this distance that its skin is much stronger, if it's too durable, I might have to attack its brain directly like with orcs. I coat my legs in stellar magic and launch myself toward its front legs, slicing right through its tendon as I pass by, causing it to stumble. Using my advantage, I rush under its body and slice at the other leg, bringing the monster crashing down. Or at least, that was supposed to happen. Before I can formulate a reason for it to still be standing, I feel an impact rock my body, launching me at great speeds before I could even register the pain. Tumbling a few times before coming to a stop, I begin hurling up my breakfast along with some blood, taking a moment to catch my breath. From how hard I got hit, I wouldn't be surprised if I had a broken rib, I'm most likely only alive due to heroic will increasing my stats against a stronger enemy. Now onto the pressing issue, how in the hell did it kick me? It should be immobile. 
Looking over, I see the irregular begin running towards me at a surprising speed, causing me to hurriedly get my feet in preparation for the inevitable fight. Seeing its bloodied legs still running without a care or a wound, I curse under my breath. Regeneration. A trait only known to be in some lower floor monsters, and even then not at that speed. While still not enough to save itself from a powerful attack, nothing I can do right now as a level 1 qualifies as a powerful attack by its standards. Shit, I wanted to defeat it to level up but it seems that it's just not my day. I'm just glad I told that girl to get out of here and get someone strong. Leaping to the side to avoid its pounce, I try to formulate a strategy. This dance of death continues for a while, with me slashing at its legs or its side every so often to bide time. Its speed is faster than mine, so I can't just escape from this situation. The only reason I can dodge and deal damage is due to my superior acceleration courtesy of Celestial Ascent. But this can only go on for so long. Sliding under its attack while slashing its leg, I suddenly feel intense heat originating from my back. Looking behind me, I see the monster's head looking down on me with a golden hue lighting up its mouth. I flare stellar magic, shooting me backward just as a blinding flame assault where I had just been. The heat is so intense it burns through the ground and singes my hair, causing my throat to dry up even from this distance. Calling that a fire breathe seems to not do it justice, getting hit by that, nothing would be left. Why would it only wait until now to use that? The good answer is that it can't use that attack irresponsibly, it must need time to charge or maybe damages itself by using it. The bad answer is that the monster is done playing around, and this fight just went from waiting for a stronger adventurer into a desperate fight to survive. The irregular then jumps towards me at blinding speed, narrowly dodging its attack, I face the beast with my renewed judgment of its capabilities. It seems like it was the bad answer. But why would a monster ever play around in a fight, I was even harming it? Wait, if irregulars grow by eating magic stones, do they have a digestion time? Maybe it had just absorbed the power from a previous feast and grown stronger? This is bad. And even if I could count on my acceleration, my mind reserves are not infinite and are in fact getting low. Going into a mind down while facing this beast would be a death sentence. I just have to hope that my power is enough to bypass its regeneration. Jumping out of its attack, I leap onto its backside before running up to its neck, concentrating stellar magic into my arms and legs, I perform my fastest and strongest slash yet, cleaving cleanly into its neck. Seeing that it's not enough to decapitate it, I separate my sword from the cleaved neck before jumping with a spin, using the additional rotational energy and putting everything into the strike for a second time. Bringing my sword down onto the monster's head only to be met with a clang, and only a chip on its heart and skull to show for my effort. Ha ha ha, ahh shit. I fall to the ground helplessly due to a mix of both resignation and fatigue. The only thing interrupting my fall being a kick from the irregular, sending me tumbling across the ground once again. My mind reserves are nearly depleted, chest damaged, and from the battered state of my utility belt, likely no potions to save me. Truly a desperate situation. Well, I did at least save the girls from their fate in this life. I'm sorry, goddess of earth, I won't be able to kill that black dragon, you'll have to find another soul to do it. Raising my head to face my death head on, oddly I'm not greeted by the irregular staring down at me, instead, it is looking off to the side. Matching the direction of its gaze, I'm greeted by the sight of a tearful and afraid young girl, the same young girl that I had already saved. What the hell is she doing here? Seeing the infant dragon make its way toward her with slow, intimidating steps, rekindles my previously helpless state of mind. How could I have been so pathetic? Didn't I want to survive? To catch up to the others? How could I have just laid down and died? Casting celestial ascent with everything I have, the familiar embrace of power envelopes me. No, not quite familiar. It's stronger, smoother, faster. Discarding questions on why for later, I envelop my legs with stellar magic and sprint towards the irregular at speeds I had never reached before. Seeing my approach, the irregular turns towards me and releases the flame breath that it had been charging up. I avoid the deadly attack before jumping toward its head, I can't keep this state up for long. After all, enchanting myself like this is burning through my mind, I have to finish this now. I already know slicing through its neck is pointless as the giant wound from not even a minute ago is already healed fully. I have to cleave through its head, but a normal slash won't do it, no matter how much I put into the strike. I have to add something more. Although I've never been able to successfully imbue my sword with stellar magic, I know that it's possible. And what better time to learn than now, right? Condensing all my stellar magic into my hands, I force it, will it, into my sword, dredging up every ounce of determination to fuel my desire. Determination to protect. To survive? To grow? I didn't know, nor did I care, all I knew is that I was not going to lose here. My magic responds to my eager wish and my upheld sword hums with power, shining like a sun had descended onto the floor, dispersing the mist in the vicinity and coating the surroundings in light. With the monster's head now in range, I bring down my sword with as much power as possible, combining all of my rage, strength, and determination. The culmination of my entire being, my feelings, and my technique. Crying out to the heavens as my will coalesces into an ultimate attack. Get fuyuked. My roar continues as I make contact with its skull, feeling the resistance then give as my sword cleaves the beast in two, landing on the ground in an undignified heap as the ashes from the felled beast showered down around me. Feeling the usual pull of unconsciousness, I hope that the girl can bring me to safety and that I didn't destroy the irregular magic stone. 
After all, that thing would probably fetch me quite a bit of Valis. Chapter 17, Reaction and Level 2 Elise POV. Leading a group consisting of Kagaya, Lyra, Ryuo, and Nis, we made our way back home after dealing with the incident on the 18th floor. This morning, someone rushed to the guild and explained that someone was threatening to take over Rivera. Although the guild holds no power or control over Rivera, they recognize its necessity for adventurers, thus they asked us to resolve this issue. Luckily with an elite group our size, rushing to the 18th floor didn't take that long. Although the offending group flaunted their level 3 strength, it seemed that they were the type who were strong against the weak yet weak against the strong. Once we arrived the dispute was promptly solved with the group getting a free night in a prison cell for their troubles. Currently heading through the 11th floor on our way back, there's an eerie feeling permeating the air. Though I can't put my finger on why. At least that was before Kagaya decided to speak up. Elise, did you notice? We haven't spotted a monster since arriving on this floor. That was it. Once I heard her observation, my instinct screamed that there was something wrong, something very wrong. Let's hurry our pace girls, something feels wrong. Following my order, we ran through the floor at high speeds, keeping a watchful eye on the surroundings to find something that would explain this phenomenon. A roar echoes throughout the area, causing our group to come to a stop. Was that an infant dragon? Ryu speaks up in a quiet voice, with our heightened senses we can just barely hear the sound of battle in the distance. I think so, let's check it out, it might be Rilat Dash. Help. My words are cut off by a resounding yell, looking toward the source, we see a young Chianthrope girl, no older than 14, running towards us. Her face was a mess of tears and dirt, an empty quiver across her back. P please help him, Aestria Familia, you have to help him. Kagaya steps forward, causing the young girl to stop talking and catch her breath. Come yourself, child, tell us more about the situation. Taking a shaky breath, she collects herself before answering the question. There's an infant dragon, an irregular, mister is fighting it but he can't win, he saved me to fight it alone, you have to save him. Alright we'll definitely save him, do you know what he looked like? He had white hair and blue eyes, and and his face was handsome. He had a dark black sword dash. Before she can finish, Ryu rockets off to where we heard the noise. I understand that does sound a lot like Sirius, but we can't just leave her here, it would seem like we're abandoning her. Hell, we don't even know where Sirius is. Don't worry little one, we'll save him, now which way was it? And what's your level? I'm a level 2, he was that way. As soon as the girl points in the direction she came from, the rest of us sprint forwards, luckily for Ryu, it seems like she is headed the right way. Being a level 2, the Chianthrope girl should be strong enough to survive on this floor, not that there seem to be any monsters around here anyways. Soon arriving where Ryu is, we see an all too familiar scene, a massacre. Ryu is frantically looking around searching for Sirius while simultaneously praying she doesn't find him, a state Kagaya quickly snaps her out of. Think, Ryu. She said that he was fighting it, these people only got slaughtered. Even then, we must focus on the irregular before it takes more lives, tending to the dead comes after. Although the fog makes us unable to see very far, our frantic searching with our enhanced senses eventually comes to fruition as we find where the monster is. The unfortunate thing is that it is currently charging right toward the young girl at a speed befitting a level 3. Even knees won't be fast enough to get there in time. Before I can lament my weakness, a gold blur cuts through the air, dodging the fire attack from the monster. As the mysterious adventurer faces the irregular, I'm surprised to see that it's serious. Since when can he move at such speeds? Thankfully, his intervention bought us the time to reach the monster, but before we can attack we see Sirius sword light up with his enhancement magic, causing all of us to collectively stop in our tracks in surprise. With his sword looking like the night sky but with a myriad of pretty colors, he leapt toward the monster. Our group didn't move an inch to help him, were we stunned by the beautiful sight? His look of determination? Our instincts telling us to let this play out? Either way, a scene that looked like it was taken from a fairy tale was played out before our eyes as Sirius cleaved through the monster. Get few walked. A certain elegant elf deadpans at the battle cry while the rest of us watch in excitement as the irregular bursts into ash while the victor collapses onto the ground. Ryu rushes towards his fallen body as soon as we break out of our trance, casting her Noah heal to restore his injuries while Lyra pockets the large magic stone that had dropped. Winning against insurmountable odds, incredible power, and saving a pretty girl, he looked just like a hero, much like when we first met him. Though I will be sure to tease him about his heroic shout once he wakes up. Looking over at Ryuo who is carefully embracing his head on her lap with an expression full of worry and relief, I get the urge to tease her later too. I then feel an inexplicable ache forming in my chest. Pushing down the odd feeling, I walk up to Ryuo who seems to have calmed down from her earlier outburst of emotions. Seeing as she has placed Sirius' head back onto the ground with her face covered in a deep blush. Ah, why'd you stop holding him like that? I bet he would definitely appreciate it. She glares at me while her face somehow gets even redder. Cute. Anyways, we should head back and report this to the guild. Hey, little girl are you okay? The girl shakes out of her dazed state before running over, peeking down at Sirius with a light blush. Oh my, Ryuo, it seems you might have some competition. I I am fine, thank you. Is he going to be okay? Yeah, he'll be fine, just needs some rest is all. We never did catch your name or familia. Ah, uh, yes, my name is Naza Erises of the Mayake Familia. We were making our way to the 18th floor but then. Oh, I'm sorry. 
We'll escort you back to Orario. All right. Thank you. Is it okay if I see him after? I was saved by him and don't even know his name. I want to thank him clearly, and, well, maybe I can learn more about him. She finishes her sentence with her blush getting deeper and her tail wagging slightly. Oh you definitely have competition now. Looking at this girl so obviously in love, that annoying ache returns once again. Sure, but we have to get back to the surface first. His name is Sirius by the way, Ryuo, do you want to carry him up? She looks up at me in excitement before returning to her normal stoic expression. I suppose I could, I'm the fastest one here so his weight won't affect our travel speed. I give her a blank stare in response as she loads him across her back, using her belt to keep him secured while Kagaya chuckles in the background. All right, let's move out. When we leave I want Ryuo to take Sirius home while everyone else will report the situation to the guild. Naza, your god is likely waiting outside the dungeon after feeling his children die, if not we'll take you home after. I receive a chorus of nods with Naza repeating Sirius under her breath. Our group easily made our way to the surface in under an hour. Ryuo heads home with Sirius while the rest of us enter the guild to relay what had happened, Naza doing most of the talking as my ache, her god, comforts her. Sirius POV, one day later. Suddenly opening my eyes, I slowly observe the familiar surroundings. Sifting through the cloudy memories, I try to make sense of what had occurred. So, if my memories are to be believed, I killed the irregular infant dragon by somehow enhancing my sword with stellar magic. After having already been beaten down by the monster for a while. Well, better late than never. Checking my body for any injuries, the only indication that I had been hurt was bandages wrapped around my torso and a scar across my arm. It seems like one of the girls had healed me. I'll also have to thank that girl for bringing me back. Feeling a stiffness throughout my body, I begin stretching, getting a dose of satisfaction with each pop of my joints. Looking out the window at the morning sun just peeking over the wall, I guess I slept through the night. I then hear a knock on the door before it opens to reveal Mother Astria. Good morning Sirius. It appears you had quite an adventure yesterday. Ah uh, yeah, I suppose. Do you think that was enough for a level up? It would be quite problematic if it wasn't. Let's get your status updated. I then take off my bandages, revealing a large bruise along with some small scars, and bend over before feeling the familiar numbing heat coming from my back. You can now level up, I'm guessing you want to do so. Of course. I feel the numbing heat increase for a brief moment before receding to normal while at the same time, my body undergoes a change. My mind I can feel is stronger, more potent, and in greater quantity. My vision becomes clearer as I can make out more details around me, my brain processing the information faster while I can sense everything in the room, an odd feeling. It seems this is part of leveling up, I'll have to see later how this has affected my strength and speed. You got a new skill, Fufu, it seems quite fit for you. Now for your development abilities, you have Hunter, Abnormal Resistance, Swordsman, Mage, and one I haven't seen before, Magic Sense. From my studies, I know what all of those abilities do, except for Magic Sense, it seems that I've already gotten a unique development ability like Elisa's Fire Flash. From the name, I have a feeling it will make reflecting magic usable in battle. I'll go with magic sense. Alright, here's your status. Congratulations on being the fastest level up in the history of Orario. She says before handing me the status sheet. Equals 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 Name, Sirius. Level, 1-2. Strength, SS1102-I0. Endurance, S968-I0. Dexterity, SS1112-I0. Agility, SS1124-I0. Magic, SSS1297-I0. Magic Sense, I. Skills. Heroic Will. Strike of Hope. When facing a stronger enemy, landing an attack passively charges the skill, user can discharge the accumulated power in one strike by activating the skill. Magic. Celestial Ascent. Equals 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 Looking over the description of the new skill, Strike of Hope seems to be great for facing against stronger opponents, but useless in everyday adventuring and large hordes of monsters. Still a great skill, one that will be invaluable when I face down the Black Dragon. Now Sirius, at the Denatus concerning your level up, would you prefer me to say you had a previous familia? That would remove much of the attention you would receive if they know the truth. No, tell them the truth about you being my first familia. I don't plan on slowing down my pace to level 3 after all. Is that so? Well, you should go downstairs to tell the girls about your achievement and that you're now awake, you made them quite worried last night, particularly Ryuu. I feel a slight heat wash over my face as I rush to put on a shirt from my dresser. I'll do that, thanks for the update, Mother Astria. Of course, and Sirius, I'm proud of you. A warmth envelopes my body at her simple but heartfelt praise. Thank you Mother Astria, I should get down there now. I then made my way downstairs, entering the common room where I spotted most of the familia either talking or doing their own activities. Hey guys, ah, uh, I'm up. 
Everyone simultaneously turned their heads at my introduction. Expressions of recognition flashed through the room before smiles filled with relief and joy set onto their faces. Feeling the familiar feeling of warmth return, Elise speaks up. We're glad you're back, had a few of us worried there. But man, that was quite a spectacle, you sliced right through that thing. A-H-H, thank you wait. You saw it? Then were you the ones who took me back? Yup, we got there at the last second to see it, so you can rest assured that you definitely saved that girl. And Ryuo was the one to bring you back here, she also gave you some, ahem, very soothing healing, yes. I look over to Ryuo who has her head turned to the side with a red blush adorning what I could see on her face. I see, thank you Ryuo, for bringing me back and healing me. Though I have to ask, who changed me? Seeing Ryuo hide her face behind her hands, I think I found one of the culprits. Maryuo speaks up to answer my question. That would be my, Ryuo, and mother. We undressed you to check for any injuries and rest assured we did not remove your undergarments. I see, thank you, sorry if it was uncomfortable. But where is my stuff? Your armor and equipment were completely destroyed save for your sword which is in the office. Luckily, the infant dragon's magic stone got you 80,000 valis, so you should easily be able to recover, maybe even get an upgrade. Now, is there anything else to tell us? Elise gives me a knowing smile, since she reads my status updates she must have guessed my fight would be enough to level up. Yeah, I'm a level 2 now. The room is divided into two states at my revelation. Elise, Kagaya, Ryuo, and Lyra, the four who both have seen my status updates and my fight, nod as if expecting the information. While the rest of the girls have wide-eyed expressions. Even if they knew I was rapidly improving, it would still be a shock that I had leveled up in five months, beating the Sword Princess Ace's record of one year for the fastest level up by quite a large margin. W what? Level 2 already? Yup, I mean knees, you saw that fight, did you really expect him to remain a level 1 after that? I I guess not. But it's still quite shocking. Yep, if I didn't see his progress I would say it's a lie, but to be honest he's been ready to level up for a while. Anyways, we're planning to go on an expedition in a couple of months, you'd only be a supporter, but would you like to come? I'd love to. But wouldn't I still slow you guys down? Nah, this one we're going with the Loki Familia in a joint expedition, and they bring their own level 2 supporters, so we'd already be going at a slower pace. Just spend the time between getting used to your new strength and studying up on the lower floors, and of course, get stronger with the time you have. With your magic and training, I expect you to not be that far behind the level 3s. Understood Captain. I stand straight in a mock salute, causing a couple of laughs to emerge. Well, I still have quite the bruise, so I'm gonna hold off on training for today. Yeah, let's get you some new equipment, then tonight we can eat at the Hostess of Fertility to celebrate your achievement. A chorus of agreement resounds through the room. Alright, well, no time like the present, go grab your sword, Sirius, and we can head out. We'll report your level to the guild on our way to Babel as well. Oh okay, I'll get my valise from upstairs. Yep, and don't forget your reward for the infant dragon magic stone, it should be in a bag beside your sword. Now, Ryuo, do you want to come with us? Their conversation fades out as I head upstairs, quickly finding my stash of valis and grabbing my spare backpack to hold it all. Checking my appearance in the mirror before going downstairs, I notice my hair has been cut shorter and choppier, giving me a more robust appearance. Most likely due to the heat from the fire breath they had to fix up my hairstyle, but I like the new look. I then make my way to the office, eyeing my sword in its scabbard resting against the desk with a bag of coins placed beside it. Storing the coins in my bag and hooking the scabbard to my belt loop before heading to the entrance, seeing Elise waiting for me. You got everything. Yep, I haven't spent very much for a while, so I hope it's enough. Well, how much is it? In total, around 900,000 valis. Holy sh yeah, that's more than enough. Honestly, with that amount of money, you could probably get a quality set of armor that would last you until level 5, although it's your choice. No, I'd rather not have to buy a new armor with every level up after all. Good thinking, then let's go. For your armor, we'll likely need to order it rather than buy it off the shelf, so you might need to wait a week before going deep into the dungeon, but you can use that time to get used to your new strength. Okay, I want to practice enhancing my sword with stellar magic as well. Are we ready to go? Yup, we were just waiting on Ryuu but it seems she's done. I then turn to where Elise was looking and see what is likely the prettiest girl I had ever seen. A position previously held by Mother Astria, but this girl's beauty surpassed even that of a goddess. Long golden hair tied in a ponytail by a dark blue ribbon, a light blue sundress that perfectly fit around her curves with white gaiters reaching all the way to her knees, showing only a peak of her thighs while leaving everything else to my very active imagination. A beautiful fairy princess. That was all that I could think of when I saw the current appearance of Ryuo. It seems that my scrutinizing stare was noticed as she grew a light blush while looking down. Realizing my mistake, I began to wear a similar flushed expression, instinctively turning my head away while Elise speaks up. Ah Ryuo, you look stunning. Hey, can you wear this more often? Please. A absolutely not? I just, well, felt like wearing it. Just felt like it, huh? I find that hard to believe. When did you get this, anyway? You never go to formal events and when you do you always wear that suit or your regular gear. E enough of your questioning, let's go get serious new equipment. Alright alright, but is that dress fine for fighting? 
It provides enough protection, and I have a pair of hidden short swords, so I'll be fine. All right, Sirius, are you coming? Finally breaking out of my trance, I quickly run toward them, forcing my expression to remain stoic while looking straight forward to not repeat my previous mistake. Yep, let's go. And so, our group of three headed towards the center of Orario. Chapter 18, Level Up Report and Commission. Celestial Swordsman, Danmichi OC by Omega LUL 1234 Our first stop would be the guild to report my level up. Luckily, this month's Denatus would be held in a couple of days, so I will quickly get my first alias. Although seeing some of the other aliases out there, I'm not that eager to receive one. I'll have to remember to beg Mother Astria to get me a good name and not something stupid. Notably, we received many stairs making our way toward the guild, usually, this would be due to the popularity of the Astria Familia, with the looks being filled with admiration and respect. Now though, the eyes were filled with wonder and lust, there was no doubt it was due to Ryuo. Although she tried to dismiss the attention by firing a cold gaze toward the spectators, that in itself created its own charm, so her attempts didn't work. Eventually, the stairs became too much for the poor elf, so we were now stopping by a small clothing shop on the way to get her a cheap cloak to cover up her appearance. Hey, shopkeeper, would 100 valis be enough? Huh? That thing? Sure, thanks for taking it off my hands kid. Quickly closing the deal, I then turn to Ryuo and wrap her in the cloak, tying it closed with its frayed laces. Thank you, Sirius. I apologize for the inconvenience. Haha, <laughs> it's fine Ryuo. It seems that you were too beautiful. I would normally get flustered at such blatantly flirtatious words, but her current shy appearance, hiding under the cloak with a blushing face, was simply too cute not to tease. Wait. Did I possibly awake something? Am I a sadist now? No. A teasing sadist? Coming to terms with my discovery of self, we eventually found ourselves in front of the guild's reception desk, specifically Rose's desk. Astria Familia, what can I do for you? Hey Rose, we have a level up to report. I see, did you finally become a first class adventurer Elise? Nope, something even better? Come on up serious. Waving to Rose after that embarrassing introduction, I notice her eyes widen in realization while her ears perk up. See certainly that makes sense after your encounter with the irregular infant dragon. Though it is still surprising that you beat the sword princess's record so handily. Now, sign here to confirm your new level, I don't doubt you, but do keep in mind lying about a level up is a serious offense. Brushing off her surprise so fast with her professional atmosphere, that's just like Rose. Quickly signing the paper, which essentially ensures that you are the person reporting the level up and will face the consequences of lying. We then bid Rose goodbye and started towards Babel, where our main task for today awaits in my new set of armor. On our way, I decided to ask Elise something that had been bothering me. Hey, Elise. I know that when I started adventuring, I was making nothing so that's why I didn't contribute to the familia, but with my savings now, wouldn't I make a significant dent in our familia's savings? Hmm, well first off, with Lyra as our head in economics, we're a pretty frugal familia. Second, most of our needed funds come from quests and expeditions, which is why Lyra took a lot of money from when you completed that quest. Lastly, for big purchases that will last the member a long time, like the armor you're buying, any money the member doesn't have enough of comes out of the familia's funds, within reason of course, so even if you gave a bunch of it to the familia you would end up spending a lot of it anyways. I see, I guess I have to contribute to expeditions before I can help out the familia properly. Relax, you've done plenty already, and us being such a small familia, we don't have very many expenses. If you want to help the familia, then survive, and stand for justice as you did saving. Who was it again? Ah, yes, Naza. Naza. She didn't tell you her name? Well, I guess it was a pretty hectic situation. Naza is the girl you saved yesterday, you know, she was pretty cute wasn't she? MMM, I guess, her dog ears looked quite fluff ouch. I looked to my side where a cloaked Ryuo had just poked me with her level 4 strength. Looking up at me with a cold gaze, she puffed her cheeks out in a pouting manner. Indecent human. I and Elise then looked at each other, holding our stare for a moment, before simultaneously chuckling at the adorable scene, making Ryuo even madder. Now, I am not oblivious to the quite obvious sign of affection Ryuo has been showing me, and I myself am immensely attracted to her. But there comes with that a few problems. 1. What is my age in this world? And what morals should I follow concerning a relationship as far as ages go? Even as a 17-year-old, Ryuo is immensely mature. In fact, you could say a 15-year-old here could be considered an adult in terms of maturity from back on Earth. Regardless, I decided long ago that I would only date someone once they reach 18 and not think any longer on the subject. Second, my place is in the Astria Familia. I, as a man, am allowed to be a member because they trust me to not be a lustful asshole, if I started dating Ryuo, how would that affect my standing? And don't even get me started on what would happen if we somehow didn't work out. Third, Ryuo is an elf. Her increased lifespan due to her race isn't a problem as once I reach level 7, aging begins to slow rapidly, so at least I wouldn't be leaving her alone after I die, but it's due to her culture. Elves only ever take one partner, for life, so I can't exactly date her so casually, the only option for a romantic relationship would be marriage, and I cannot be certain I love her that much just yet. Lastly, I'm not certain Ryuo herself realizes her own feelings yet, most likely due to her elven upbringing making her extremely innocent with matters about relationships. 
So waiting a year until Ryu turns 18 will come before I ask her to be mine. Not only would it become my acceptable age for a partner, but it would also give both of us enough time to sort out our feelings and not make me seem like a pervert to the whole familia. After all, if a year and a half of abstinence aren't enough to gain their complete trust, what would? Though I should probably talk to Mother Astria about all this, I would also ask her to get Ryuo to confront her feelings before I essentially pop the question. Even if her confused and flustered response would be extremely satisfying to see. Yup, I'm definitely some kind of sadist. Ending my internal monologue, we reach Babel. Specifically, the floor where Hephaestus Familia's best smiths sell their wares and take custom orders. Elise has a quick talk with the receptionist before she brings us to a separate room, where the constant hammering of metal echoes past the door. Here is Dvalin's forge, please do not hesitate to ask me any further questions. The receptionist then leaves, presumably to return to her desk. Hey Elise, why are we here? All you said to her was we're here for armor and she dropped us off here. Oh, Dvalin is contracted to the Astria Familia to make all of our armor. Of course, anything he made you before would have been too expensive and out of your league, but now you got the strength and money to get you something from him. I see, I can assume he made your armor as well. Yep, apparently my crimson flower heat dress is still considered one of his best works, and that was two years ago, so he should be able to make you something good for that amount of money. Hell, you might be able to get a first class set of armor with how light you like it. I see, did he make yours too Ryu? I receive a nod in response. Okay, uh, are we gonna go in? I already knocked so he'll come once he's finished with his hammering. It's rude to interrupt a craftsman during their work you know. We wait outside for another few minutes in silence, if not for the constant clang of metal, before the hammering stops and the door is opened to reveal an old man. The old man looks to be in his fifties, slightly shorter than me while having a wide frame filled with muscles and a large beard, singed at the edges. Truly the stereotypical appearance of a dwarf, nothing like the feminine Asta. Scarlet Harnel, the Gale, good to see you. Who's the brat? Haha, <laughs> Dvalin. Nice to see you again, the last time we were here was for Rihanna, right? Anyways, this is Sirius, our newest familia member and a new level 2, so you can't just call him by his alias just yet. A level 2? You know I don't make anything below second class armor. Of course, but you know, he isn't your regular level 2. I mean, he leveled up in only 5 months and can already be considered an elite level 2 in terms of combat prowess. Seeing Elise instantly switch from her playful mood to her serious mood is always a spectacle. It is also very hot, but I have a feeling if I said that out loud I would get more than just a poke from a certain elf. 5 months? Whatever. Kid, show me what you got. You got your sword there, swing it around a little, and what's your budget? I have 900,000, and that's my entire savings so I can't budge on it. I can start my movements but I am still recovering. I also haven't gotten used to my new strength. That's fine kid, just need to see how you fight. Also, take off your clothes, makes it easier for how your muscles move. I then get slightly flushed, knowing that the two girls are still in the room. Turning towards them I answer a sudden question that just came to me. D did you guys do this too? Their shocked faces quickly snap out of their daze, and both girls frantically shake their heads in unison, quite a comical sight. And no of course not. What the hell Valen? What? If you don't want to watch you girls can leave. Since he's a man, his muscles should clearly show through his skin, while you girls don't have nearly as much definition. Are you calling us fat? While they have their argument, I slowly tune out the world to forget my embarrassment, a common technique I've learned to obtain maximum focus during training. Taking off my shoes, pants, belt, and finally my shirt, I pull Infinite Eclipse out of its scabbard and begin my regular training routine, instantly noticing the difference in strength and speed. Luckily it seems that my perception and senses have increased along with it, so I don't suddenly move faster than I can think, that would be unfortunate and dangerous. Lost in my movements, I begin enchanting my body with stellar magic, slowly rolling the thrum of power along my limbs, stretching and condensing the area of enchantment, before finally bringing it all towards my sword. Feeling resistance, I push the stellar magic into the sword, willing the phenomenon that had given birth to my strongest attack into creation. Eventually, I break through the barrier, and my sword hums with power, shining brightly while simultaneously being coated in pitch black darkness, truly a curious sight. Returning the stellar magic to my body, I do one final slash, ensuring not to lose control of my newly acquired strength, before returning my sword to its sheath and returning my attention to the world. Looking back, I see three faces filled with surprise and amazement. While initially wanting to bask in their astonishment, I quickly remember my state of dress. My face turned beet red in embarrassment, I am barely able to muster a sentence. Why why you two were watching? My words seem to break the two out of their state of wonder, both quickly forming blushes surpassing mine before running out and closing the door behind them with a concurrent I'm sorry. Taking a deep breath to calm down my rapidly beating heart, I then turned to Dvalin, seeing a face filled with approval and excitement. They weren't wrong to call you special. That sword technique is already among the best in Orario, in technique only that is. And the way you enhance yourself with magic like that, and chantless as well. You got this old man's heart beating in excitement kid. Ah, thank you Dvalin, did you need anything else? Yeah, if you don't mind, keep doing some overhead swings and stabs back and forth. Alright, and you still need my clothes off. Of course. 
About an hour passed, with Dvalin watching me do different stances and swings, sometimes rolling a measuring tape around parts of my body. Although it was slightly embarrassing to be nearly completely nude in front of this random dwarf at first, his professional attitude quickly dispelled any awkwardness. All right, that should be everything. It'll be 850,000 with you paying half up front. Come back at the end of the week and I'll tell you what it does. Goodbye. After hastily putting my clothes back on and giving him the money, I was unceremoniously thrown out of the forge. Before meeting Valen, it would have been extremely rude. And while still being rude, I now know that it just means he's passionate about starting the project. Returning to the lobby, I see Elise and Ryu looking at a scarf. Burying any lingering feelings of embarrassment, I make my presence clear to them. Hey girls, I'm done. Elise then turns to me, only averting her eyes for a second before taking a moment to compose herself. Phew, alright. Then let's continue, what else did we need to get today? I guess we're just collectively going to ignore what happened. I'm quite fine with that. I need a new backpack, belt, potions, dagger, and boots. Yes, unfortunately, while my bag was destroyed in the fight, it at least did its final job of keeping everything within it safe. So I don't need to recreate my pocket notebook filled with maps, that would have been annoying to remake. Okay, let's get going. She then pulls Ryuo along with her down the stairs of Babel, me following closely behind her. After that, it was an uneventful afternoon of me buying new equipment, except for the belt, according to Ryuo, it would be best to wait until my armor is made to get a new one. Returning home, I stored everything I had away, quietly lamenting that my savings have essentially gone down to zero, before having a celebratory dinner at the Hostess of Fertility. The next day, Orario was shocked at the news of a new level 2, one having become one in five months, setting a new record. But I did not know this, as I had spent the next couple of days training at the house, adapting to my new status. Chapter 19, Denatus and Patrol Astria POV. Now that the boring matters have been taken care of, let's get started on the thing we're all here for. The naming ceremony. Here it is. The crux of the Denatus, where gods meet once every three months in Babel to discuss the state of the city, exchange information, and see which adventurers have leveled up while giving them an alias or changing a previous one. The last activity being called the naming ceremony. After Evilus was completely eradicated from the city, the state of the city has been essentially constant, only reporting constant growth after having healed from the Great Feud three years ago. This also means that with such serious topics no longer being discussed, the naming ceremony has not only taken the focus in terms of time but also excitement, which is bad news for Sirius. Many of these gods like to have fun with children, especially with those not their own. Although the naming of high-level adventurers, usually level 4 and above, has always been given serious thought, lower-level adventurers naming is essentially viewed as entertainment in the form of comedy. Unfortunately, Sirius falls under the second category. Remembering his desperate plea for me to get him an alias he can use with at least a minimal amount of pride, I renew my determination to grant that child his wish. From the fans familia, 19 years old Cyril Collar, became a level 2 last month and has been an adventurer for 5 years, and fights with a spear? Any suggestions? Please go easy on that child, he has worked so hard to get to this point. Nope. Fans looks down with a fallen expression, seemingly conceding to what was about to occur. How about ultimate piercing lance? Or shiny prince of the lance? Oh, I got a good one. Fate weaver of the luminous night. Yes. W wait? Isn't that practically a sentence? Too bad. Fans feeble attempt to save his child from their fate was futile, causing many of the gods to laugh at his misery. Scary. I just have to believe in my familia's status as not only among the top in strength but also for the safety and stability we have constantly provided for the city. The Denatus continued like this for a while, only a few adventurers getting names they wouldn't have shame in using, those all being level 4s. Now, this is our last one, just reported a couple of days ago. From the Astria Familia, 16-year-old Sirius, no last name, and he's a male? What the hell Astria? So the rumors were true. Yes, he is a kind child, I can trust him to be with my girls. Well if you say so, anyways he fights with the sword and a stellar magic enchantment, quite rare. He's been an adventurer for 5 months? It says here that you're his first familia too. Murmurs break out across the room, either doubting the credibility of the information or reveling at a new record breaker, while some just watched on in amusement. Yes, he has worked incredibly hard to make such progress. So he beat my ace's record? Damn it. Anyways, he beat an irregular infant dragon to level up, quite impressive. So, everyone, have at him. The room starts descending into madness. Shining light of the descended heavens. Starbound sword of justice. Slashing sword slasher. No, anything but those. Standing up tall while sending a pulse of divinity, I silence the room to end this madness. After everything my girls have done for this city, I would expect you to treat a child of mine with the proper respect. You all agree, no. That seems to have calmed them down, with many sitting down with embarrassed expressions. I never like to flaunt our status as the protectors of the city, after all, we do so in the name of justice, not to gain prestige. But it was getting quite ridiculous. Ahh, calm down Astria. We were just playing around. After that, a moment of silence enveloped the room as the gods began to think seriously of a proper alias for the boy, the same treatment the level 4s got earlier. How about Limit Breaker? Hmm, nah, except for his record breaking, it has nothing to do with him. 
something to do with stars and swords. Hmm. Just then, a voice that can charm even fellow gods speaks up. How about celestial sword? Great. As expected of the beautiful Freya. Multiple words of praise are thrown toward the goddess of love and beauty while she turns toward me. That would be acceptable, no? Short and sweet, just like your other children. That is, good, yes. Thank you, Freya. Of course, our familias are both shields to Orario, no? Okay, then Sirius of the Astria Familia will henceforth bear the name Celestial Sword. And that is the end to this Dinatus, see you guys in three months. Leaving the hall with a smile on my face, I am met with a large group of adventurers, all there to escort their gods back to their homes. Searching for my escort, I eventually find Elise fiddling with her sheathed sword off to the side before perking up at my appearance. Hey mother, how did it go? Did he get a good one? I think it went well. Sweet. So, what's his alias? Celestial Sword. A-H-H, that sounds so cool. Come on, let's get home and tell him the good news. You should have seen how nervous he was when I left to pick you up. Everyone was laughing at him. Hmm, I do hope he likes it. Should I tease him and say he got one of the other ones? Oh, I like that idea. What one were you thinking? Slashing Sword Slasher. Oh god, that's perfect. Like that, we made our way back home. It was quite an amazing sight when I told Sirius his fake alias, but with how dead his face became and all the girls rushing to console him, the facade was impossible to keep up. When I then told him that it was one of the suggested ones and gave him his actual alias he thanked me on his hands and knees, nearly to the point of tears. Us gods can be quite cruel, can't we? Sirius POV, one day later. With me having gotten used to my new strength during my past two days of training, and with me being unable to go into the dungeon until my armor was finished, I was itching to do something. Especially after that alias scare. How horrible can the gods be to have that be a suggestion? Just thinking about what could have been makes me shudder. Thankfully such a fate was avoided thanks to Mother Astria, although Celestial Sword is still slightly cringy, I think any title would be. In comparison to some other aliases out there, mine is pretty great. Entering the living room, I am greeted at the sight of Ryu and Selty both reading together on the large couch while Elise was drawing in her sketchbook. From the way she was looking out the window, it seemed that she was doing a perspective landscape of the garden. Off to the side, I can also see Kagaya folding a piece of paper. Over my time here, I've come to learn that the Far East in this world is essentially the same culture as Japan, with Kagaya enjoying hobbies from her homeland like origami, Japanese art style, and calligraphy. Rather fitting activities for such a diligent and proper girl. That is until she gets mad and starts spouting swear words in ways I never thought possible. Ending my internal monologue, I call out to Elise. Hey, Elise. Hmm? What's up, Sirius? Need something. Kind of, I'm bored so I'm wondering if there's anything I can do. She then pauses her drawing and brings her hand to her chin in a thinking pose. Hmm, well with you being a level 2, I guess you can start patrolling. I was originally going to introduce you to it after the expedition but I suppose doing it now is fine too. You are studying the upper floors, right? Don't worry, Lyra made sure that I knew everything. From helping her with your guy's last expedition I already knew most of what I needed. Alright, well our team was gonna go on a patrol later after Iska's group get back, so you'll be joining us. Us being. Ah, my team is me, the beautiful Scarlet Harnel herself, Ryu, and Selty. So I guess you'll be our temporary fourth member, slashing sword. Please don't call me that. Fine fine, it was just too hilarious, you should have seen your face last night. Yeah okay, by the way, I know Ryu's alias is Gale, but what's Celtis? Oh, hers is the Crimson Monarch, due to having amazing fire magic despite being level 3, though she gets even shyer whenever she hears it, so use it sparingly. I see. After waiting around for a while, with me going over the plan for the expedition, Iska's group returned, meaning it was our turn to go patrol. With Elise breaking the news to Selty and Ryu about my joining for the day, we headed out to look after the city, with Elise giving me many tips and expectations for what to do. Now, while we are protectors of the city, the Ganesha Familia are the actual police force. Essentially, we patrol the city when we can and answer any calls for help from them, while the Ganesha Familia handles the containment and punishment of criminals. They also guard the gate and patrol the city, they are a large familia after all. Okay, so what exactly is our purpose, it sounds like they can do everything on their own. Well, any bit helps, but most importantly, the people who handle the patrolling around the city from the Ganesha Familia are only level 2s, while fine for most things, if there are any stronger adventurers they would be kinda screwed. So we are essentially the elite backup. Precisely? So while we do patrol, we can only see so much, so if you ever see a red flare in the sky, that means that a Ganesha patrol unit needs help from us. Though you won't be of much help until you get to level 3 so don't worry about that for now, I think I understand. The Astria Familia are essentially the SWAT force of Orario while Ganesha are the regular police. Except that the SWAT force here patrols when they can as well. Wait, what happens when we go on expeditions? We make sure to tell the Ganesha Familia, they have just as many stronger adventurers after all. The guild also manages expeditions to ensure that not too many strong adventurers are gone from the city at the same time. It's for that reason you need to notify the guild whenever you go to the dungeon for more than a day or leave the city, but that comes once you reach level 4. Continuing our walk, with Elise, Ryu, and Selty showing me various parts of the city, it was an enjoyable time. 
We only had to break up one argument so far, it seems that seeing the Astria Familia is enough of a deterrent to cause trouble. Seeing the happy and peaceful expressions of all of the civilians, I think I can understand better why these girls love being a part of this Familia so much. This strength is granted through the gods and our hard work, it feels good to put it to such a use. Eventually, I spot a group of five people entering an alley. Three middle-aged men around their thirties, one woman looking in her late twenties, and a young Renard girl dressed in a fairly expensive dress with her face downcast. At first glance, it doesn't appear too suspicious. Even at a second glance it only looks like a young miss being escorted through the alleys to avoid the populace. But my intuition is telling me that something is wrong, the feeling increasing whenever I see the Renard child. Seeing my inquisitive stare, Ryu sent me a questioning look. What's wrong, Sirius? Yeah, those five, I have a bad feeling about it. While I trust your instincts, we can't exactly arrest them without evidence. What do you suppose we do? Thinking about what would likely happen in different situations, I quickly formed a plan. I have an idea. If you guys go to ask them they'd likely clam up due to your power and fame. But they don't know me, or if they do I'm just a newbie level 2 to them. I'll go alone and provoke them with you guys watching, if they take the bait then great, if not we can just follow them some more. I can't explain it, I just know something's wrong. Don't worry serious, we trust you, thank you, Elise. I then part ways with the three and follow the suspicious group into the alley they had just gone into. Quickly catching up to them, I make my presence known. Hey, you guys. The four adults turn to face me while the girl keeps her head down, staying silent. Yeah, definitely suspicious. What do you want kid? I know what you guys are doing, if you don't hand over the girl then I'll tell the Astria Familia what's going on. Their laid-back demeanor instantly shifts into hardened gazes, collectively turning their bodies to face me while pulling out weapons. It seems that my hunch was right. Kidnappers maybe? I don't know how you know our faces around here, but you should have gone and told someone before coming to face us. You're dead now kid. Are you sure? He could probably get something for him. We don't handle goods with connections, you know that. Bringing out infinite eclipse, I prepare for battle. Though it seems that my preparations are unnecessary. Plunging from the roof at blistering speeds, Elise and Ryu run down on opposite walls. Each taking down an enemy on their landing, flattening their heads onto the ground, judging by the crack from the point of contact, I don't think they will be getting up anytime soon. While the two girls rush to defeat the final two enemies, I speed towards the girl, flaring stellar magic. The four enemies have roughly the strength of low-level twos. Even I could beat them, much less the two high-level fours facing them right now. The only way the enemy could get an advantage would be a hostage, hence why I am rushing to protect the Renard girl. Holding the girl in my arms, I see she is surprised, eyes wide curiosity and astonishment. But there is something, lost, in her expression. They said before they don't handle goods with connections. Could that mean this girl's family was killed? How horrible. Either way, I think it's time to take her to Astria, something is telling me not to let her get away. Is this intuition related to those foggy memories the goddess of earth mentioned? Although I can't exactly remember the entire conversation from back then, after all, I was fighting what could be akin to a walking disaster right after. The girls finish up their fight, if you could even call it that, before tying up the criminals and firing a blue flare in the sky while Selty drops down from the roof. From Elisa's teachings during our walk, I know that's the signal for Ganesha Familia members to come over. Not a minute later, two cat people show up and after Elise described the situation, they both left with a criminal in each hand, dragging them away. Elise then turns to me. It seems your intuition was spot on, great job. Now, what do we do with the girl? Does she have anybody to go to? I doubt it, you heard from them, right? No connections. Ah, I see, I guess we'll take her to the Ganesha Familia, or maybe an orphanage. No, sorry, the same feeling, my intuition is telling me to not let her go. The three girls then begin to look at me with disgust before Ryu speaks up. Disgusting, is she not too young for you? Taking a moment to process the situation, I hastily try to explain myself. No, no 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 no, not like that. I'm asking to bring her to Mother Astria, I think she might be able to figure something else. So you want her in the Familia? Ideally, yes. I just, I can't explain the feeling. I get it, I get a gut instinct too sometimes. But you should probably ask her first. Looking down at the girl, she's currently pressing her head against my chest, hiding her face from the world while holding onto my shirt for dear life. I hesitantly pat her head, causing her to look up at me with a teary expression, one filled with worry and fear. I continue to pat her head until her face softens, eyes closed in a pleased expression while her tail wags slightly from side to side. Cute. Ahem. Oh yeah, I should probably ask her quickly before Ryu starts to think I'm a pedophile or something. Hey, would you like to come home with us? You can tell us your story there, we have a very nice mother who will absolutely take care of you, and we will too. She looks up at me again, faces clouded in doubt as if searching for a hint of deceit. After a few seconds, she hesitantly nods. I then take her hand and begin walking home with the three girls taking the lead, although Ryuo is looking back at us with a scrutinizing expression. Scary. I distract myself by trying to learn more about the Renard girl. Hey, we should probably introduce ourselves. My name is Sirius, the girl with green hair is called Selty, the one with red hair is called Elise, and the pretty yellow-haired girl staring at us is Ryuo. That seems to catch Ryuo off guard. 
Her eyes widened slightly in surprise before snapping her head forward, playing off my teasing with a stoic demeanor. But you know Ryuo, I can see your ear turning red from here. Anyways, we're all adventurers and part of the Astria Familia. Would you like to tell us your name? Looking down at the girl, she carefully takes in my words before responding. Sanjao no H Haruim. And no, just Haruheim. Chapter 20, Haruheim and Armor. Celestial Swordsman, Danmichi OC by Omega LUL 1234 arriving at the Stardust Garden, Elise opens the door with her usual boldness. Mother, we're home. Finding our way into the common room, we see that both Kagaya and Mother Astria are each reading, perking their heads up at our introduction. Welcome back girls, and Sirius. Is it not a little early? Yep, it has something to do with our little guest here. Hesitantly stepping out of my shadow, Haruheim, as I learned the girl's name was, looked towards Mother Astria with an expression of wonder overtaking her usual shy and hesitant face. Yup, our mother goddess Aura will do that to you. She seems to have warmed up a bit on our walk here, giving us more of her trust, particularly me. Nice to meet you, young one. Would you tell me your name? H. Haruim. Oh, originally San Jao no Haruheim. I give her another head pat for her good work. I've come to learn that the little Renard loves head pats and that they are particularly good at calming her down. San Jao no. Surprisingly, it's Kagaya who speaks up, with shock clearly showing on her face. It seems my earlier assumption is true, Haruheim must be from the Far East. I mean with a name like that, she had to have Far East origins at the very least. Seeing Haruheim recoil from the outburst and return to hiding behind me, Kagaya takes a deep breath to calm down. My apologies for scaring you, it was simply quite a shock to hear of that name. Seeing Haruheim relax once more and return a small nod, we all give Kagaya a questioning gaze. The Sanjano clan is a powerful clan from my homeland, known for their ancestors having once contracted a spirit before the gods descended. Although now they are known for being the guardians of the Sanjano shrine. Only the direct descendants of the family are allowed to bear the San Jauno name, how is one of their heirs so far from home? We then recount the story to the two, from the initial suspicion, to the fight, and lastly, my intuition telling me to let her join the familia. The last point seemingly piquing Mother Astria's interest. She then pats the couch next to her, where Haruheim then sits, guiding me along by my hand to sit on the opposite side. Now, Haruheim, would you be able to tell us your story? Oh okay. Tightening her grip on my hand, she then tells us her story and how she got to Orario. As Kagaya said, she was a young lady of the San Jauno noble family of the Far East. Someone had framed her for eating an offering for the shrine, angering her father who disowned her and gave her to a guest to be taken away. On the way to wherever the guest was taking her, they were attacked by monsters, and the guest ran away to leave the young Haruheim behind to die. She survived the encounter but was then captured by bandits who then sold her to a brothel in Orario. The four people who we fought being her escort to take her to the brothel. After recounting her story Haruheim burst into tears, finding relief in Astria's consoling embrace while I patted the girl's head softly. The faces around the room wore various expressions of anger and sympathy, but none of our anger could be compared to Kagaya's. Even from across the room, I could feel a cold sweat run down my face at the pure fury that was radiating from the fellow Far Easterner. An expression colder than ice with her hands pale white from being clenched. Giving up their daughter like that for a damn fruit. They are exceptionally lucky that they live so far away from me and my blade. With Haruheim eventually calming down, Astria decided to ask her the ever-important question. Haruheim, sweet child, would you like to join my familia? UMM, W what's a familia? We then spend the next few minutes clearly explaining what a familia is, particularly what the Astria familia is, everything from the Falna down to our daily patrols. At the end of the explanation, most of the confusion was gone from Haruim's face, leaving only hope and excitement. I I could have a family again. And like that, our hearts melted a little. Of course, child. So, do you wish to become my child and hold up justice along with my other children? Why yes? I I want to h help others like how you helped me. This thing is too adorable. Astria then kicked me out of the room so she could give the young girl her status. After a minute of waiting, I could hear a collection of gasps and a couple of what? S coming from inside. Thinking the worst, I ran inside to investigate. Only to find all the girls looking at a status sheet, including a, thankfully, clothed Haruheim. What's wrong? What was the outburst for? L look at this. I then peek my head over Elisa's shoulder to view the status page. Equals 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 Name, Haruheim. Level, 1. Strength, I0. Endurance, I0. Dexterity, I0. Agility, I0. Magic, I0. Skills. Mikizu Meneha, increases effects of magic and improves mind usage. Magic. Uchide no Kojachi, increases target's level by one, can only be used on one target at a time and requires a cooldown depending on the time in use, targets earn half the normal exilia when under magic's effect. 
equals 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 a similar gasp leaves my mouth level boosting magic unheard of the difference between levels is nothing to scoff at in fact this magic may be the singularly most powerful support magic in existence when used on the correct target and that would put a target on the young Renard's back if it ever got out. She would quickly become the most sought-after person in Orario for every familia. I it seems that my intuition helped me once again, huh? Why yeah, serious, t this is dash. Something that can absolutely not leave the familia, isn't that right Mother Astria? I then look up to see Mother Astria with her rare serious expression, staring hard at the status sheet before meeting my gaze. Absolutely. We will tell the rest of the familia about this tonight, but until then it does not leave this room, understood. We all return a nod to indicate our acceptance. I is there something wrong? I bend down to look up at her, finding the correct words to explain the situation. No, Haru can I call you Haru? Receiving a light nod and a smile, I then continue. Okay, Haru, you have an amazing magic, a special magic that would make a lot of people want you, many of them being bad people. While we would still protect you from them, it would be incredibly dangerous. Do you understand? I receive another nod, with a slightly worried expression. So for now, only the people in our familia will know of this magic. Once we get stronger as a familia and you learn how to protect yourself, then we can show off your amazing magic. But until then, you have to promise us that you won't tell anyone or use it without our permission, okay? Why yes, I understand. Good girl. I stand up and give her a head pat for being, as I said, a good girl. Her eyes squinting and her tail wagging, I slowly start to get lost in the feeling of giving her head pats, lightly scratching her insanely fluffy ears every so often. I quickly remove my hand after noticing my trance-like state, leaving Haru to frown slightly. Those ears, that face. Dangerous. Very dangerous. Turning back to the girls, I see they all have warm smiles on their faces, particularly Mother Astria is looking at me with pride. I also notice that Ryuo has a blush forming on her cheeks. What are you thinking about Ryuo? Astria then breaks the silence. Well, how about me and Kagaya here take you up to your room, okay Haruheim? The rest of the night passes quickly, with Haru getting settled into her room, the rest of the familia learning of their newest member, sharing similar states of shock at her magic, and then the promise to not share said magic. After I had finished my nightly sword training, I was called into the office where I was met by Mother Astria, Kagaya, Elise, Lyra, and Ryuo. There we discussed the plan for Haru, essentially boiling down to training her to defend herself and allowing her into the dungeon if she wishes. Kagaya would be in charge of her training as she was with me, doing the same regime of learning basic combat, what weapon fits best, and then training with said weapon. She would use her magic once after every training session to grow her magic stat and get her practice with it. After all, if her magic ever came out, we'd need that level boost to fight off anyone trying to take her. Overall, quite an exciting day for my first city patrol. As pleasant as it was to save such a nice girl like Haru, I hope the next few days aren't as eventful. Three days later, after getting up, washing, dressing, and eating, I began making my way toward Babel early in the morning. It has been a week since making my armor order, and I doubt that Dvalin is the type of guy to say unnecessary things, so here I am, ready to get my new armor and return to exploring the dungeon. As nice as the past three days have been, patrolling, training, socializing, and spending time on my hobbies, I have been longing for the thrill, excitement, and growth that comes from the dungeon. On another note, after Haru's first night with us, she was thrown into training the next day. From what Kagaya has said, although her progress is nothing like mine, she can be considered to be talented in combat. Haru also warmed up to the familia quickly, just as we all warmed up to her. Such a nice, cute, and pure girl. It would be worrisome if anyone hated her, hell even Kagaya was showing big sister vibes. Eventually reaching the correct floor of Babel, I greet the receptionist, although it's a different girl from last time. Hello, I'm here to pick up an order from Dvalin. I see, Familia. Astria Familia. All right, follow me. She then leads me to Dvalin's forge, knocking on the door before returning to her desk. Instead of having to wait like last time, the door opens almost as soon as the receptionist leaves. Welcome back kid, it's done. Good on ya for coming so early, lots of folks wait until the afternoon, making me sit around here. He then walks back into the forge and picks up what I presume to be my new armor. This thing is quite a beauty, even by my standards, it qualifies as a first-class armor. The plating is made with mithril to allow for your enchantment to flow freely while also providing good protection. The padding is made from a blue crab shell wrapped in leather to distribute the force, and finally minotaur skin as the base to now impede movement while also being cut resistant. The whole thing is enchanted with a simple temperature regulating spell, so while you aren't freeze or fire resistant, it'll warm you up or cool you down when you need. Putting on the armor while listening to his explanation, I'm amazed by how well it fits, it feels like I'm wearing nothing with how comfortable it is. It's amazing, good work. Yep, while the protection doesn't match up to other first-class armors, the flexibility and lightness more than make up for it. You can also upgrade it later once you get better, richer, and able to bring me some materials from the deeper floors. 
I understand, thank you, Dvalin. Does it have a name like Elise and Ryu's? Yep, her name is Stellar Spirit Liberation Armor. Oh oh, thank God that he only names armors and not aliases. Anyways, thanks again for the great work. Here's the rest of the payment. I then hand him over the rest of the payment. Good, if you need any adjustments you know where to find me. Have a good one. I decided to take my leave and started towards home, picking up a belt that fits with my armor with my remaining ballast. Passing a few looks, likely recognizing me as the new level up record holder, I eventually found myself back at the Stardust Garden. Noticing two presences on the training grounds, I decide to make a quick detour to see how Haru is doing. Do you think your enemy is just going to fucking wait for you to get ready? Again. Yes, sensei. Less talking, more running, scum. Know what? I'm just gonna let them do their own thing. Entering the common room, I'm greeted by the pleasant sight of Mother Astria carefully combing Ryu's hair while a few of the girls are doing their own thing. I take a moment to bask in the touching scene before, healing my soul that had been damaged by what had happened on the training ground. Serious, you're back already. Yes, Mother Astria. I got my armor, he said that it's a first class set of armor. This causes a few glances from the girls to head my way. Could they be jealous? Answering a few of their questions on how it feels, what it's made of, and what it does, the dreaded question eventually comes up. So what's the piece's name? If it's a first class armor he definitely named it. Lowering my head in slight embarrassment, I decided to just get this over with. A stellar spirit liberation armor. A collection of laughs resounds around the room, causing me to become even more embarrassed. Why did he choose such a damn cringy name? Just call it something simple, please? A-H-H, don't worry serious, he names all his first class armors like that. You should hear Ryu's. What was it again? Ah, uh, Star Limit Stellar Dress. That was it. So don't feel too bad, you're not gonna be saying its name unless you're talking to Dvalin about it anyways. I I guess, thanks, Elise. No problem? So, you gonna get back to the dungeon? Yeah, I have to get back into it, practice with this new armor, and finally try using my new strength in combat. Makes sense. Alright, have fun but don't die, and no new floors until you feel 100%. I'll be sure, I'm always careful. I'll see you all tonight. Parting with the girls, I then head upstairs to my room. Fastening my sword, potions, spare dagger, and notepad to my belt. I then don my new bag, mostly empty to fit dungeon loot, but containing food, water, and first aid equipment. Doing a few spins and kicks to make sure everything fits and is fastened correctly, I then make my way toward Babel, eager to get back to the dungeon and regain my lost wealth.